Good evening, everyone. My name is Jan Bradley, and um, I'm the Community Services Librarian. I work at the Clearwater Main Library, and I want to welcome you this evening to our living history of the Greenwood neighborhoods. We have a very distinguished group of panel right back behind me today. And what I'm going to do is let them introduce themselves and let them give us, the audience, um, a chance to hear what you would like to talk about this evening. Uh, when we do the introduction. So let's start right down here. With oh, Christine. no. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Our most distinguished library visitor. <laughs> Christy, would you stand for a tweet and introduce yourself and tell us what you want to talk well, about tonight? Not much. Mm -hmm. I think each of you know me. I'm Christine Morris, and I am not a native of Clearwater, but uh, my family arrived here February 1926. So I feel like I'm almost a native. And I can tell a lot of things, but uh, I will ask these questions as we go through it. Also, I worked at this place. This is almost home. I worked, here, worked with the city of Clearwater, starting the three years, about two blocks down, and moving here and worked for the city of Clearwater for 33 years. I've been retired for 10 years. I've enjoyed it. Enjoy working here. I am I'm enjoying the retirement. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Harris. I'm William Harris, McKinley Harris from Natives, and uh, I was born in Clearwater. Uh, finished high school here, Pinellas High School, and uh, taught at Pinellas High for many years and went on to other schools. Clearwater to me, of course, is home, and we've seen tremendous growth changes, but also cultural changes. We have seen in Clearwater the migration of blacks who have started to come back to the Clearwater area to give something back. We see an awful lot of uh, movement of blacks now that was not prevalent in some years since we grew up. Clearwater is a good place to live. It's a good place to rear a family. It's a good place to be. We love it. It is home, and it's a part of this growth that Florida has experienced. Thank you. Everybody knows Mamie Hodges? No. No? <laughs> <laughs> I'm Mamie Hodges, and believe it or not, I'm a retired educator. I retired from Pinellas uh, system in 89, and I've been trying to retire ever since. Uh, I am not a native of Clearwater, but I feel as though I am. Uh, both of my kids were born in Clearwater and reared here. And now they are up and out and hopefully doing good. My thing, of course, you would know after 34 years in the school system is education. And along the way, someplace, it seems I picked up politics. So <laughs> I probably would be interested in talking along those lines. Thank you. Mr. Mercer. My name is T.D. Merson. I'm not a native of uh, Clearwater. I was born in Edison, Illinois. Mm. I came here in um, 46. And I have seen many changes in this city since I've been here. Uh, when I came here, things was kind of rough, especially for black people. But now, there have been many changes. Well, I would probably like to talk about whatever on this list, you know. <laughs> whatever question you ask, then I will try to do my best to answer. Thank you very much. Mr. My name is Ron Hammond. I'm a native of Clearwater. I was born here and went to school at Pine Hill High. Uh, worked for the city of Clearwater Gas Department and young student home part-time. Uh, I was going to talk about uh, some of the segregation and stuff during my time of civil rights, which has uh, played a big part of my life growing up here in Clearwater. Thank you. Mr. Robinson. My name is E.J. Robinson, a retired affirmative action officer from the city of Clearwater. I'm not a native of Clearwater, but I've been here so long until I feel that I'm a native of Clearwater. My family first located and was relocated in this area in 1938, and it was in Largo at the time. So we lived in Largo for about six years, moving to Clearwater in 1940, 
Blue North Border School, attended schools here in Pinellas, and grew up in the military, spent time there, and returned. I, too, have seen many changes over the years from the Jim Crowness that we experienced in those years that we first came here to now. And there are many things that really could be discussed uh, that I guess it's best to discuss when we're discussing a specific issue. Thank you very much. And at this time, I'd like to introduce Paul Ritz, who is the uh, head of the branch library here from the Linwood Library. Paul is going to be our moderator this evening, and he's going to help address some of the issues that all of us have here in the audience. Paul? Great. Thank you very much. Good evening. And again, I'm Paul Ritz, and I'm a librarian at the North Greenwood branch. I, it's very difficult to try to be a librarian at North Greenwood branch because you have to live up to somebody who was here for years, and everybody <laughs> compares you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I don't know how we want to get started. Some of you, um, some of these questions are more for several of you natives than are such as I know that the questions were how, it was a house still standing. And we know now who was born in Pinellas County, so that isn't. I know for the, uh, there were three people that were here all the ones. Are the houses still live, standing that you were brought up with? No. Two? No? no? no mine is. Mine. 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 Yours is, when you were here a long time ago? Yeah, mm -hmm. but not for mine, but I was down. Uh, you did? Yes. <laughs> oh, 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 now, some, many of you, if not most, probably were around before the television even existed, or, or, or radio, was a radio, is something? Yes, yes, yes radio. 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 Television came what? Forty. So how was life around here before television? Just radio, you listen to the radio? Yes, radio was like radio. But you know, radio allowed you the use of imagination. Mm -hmm. I remember listen, listening to many of the radio programs. I remember listening to ball games, mm -hmm. and you could really imagine. TV takes away that imagination ability. It's all there. So, right, it was a lot of radio. I remember TV coming into play, but radio really gave us that ability to really just move into a world beyond. And you didn't have to be stationary. Yeah. Absolutely. You, know, you, okay. you could carry it all in the yard, all around with you. Yeah. And you said there was a Ford in it? Excuse me? What, what, you know, you're trying I to said if we could a Ford. Oh, you could get a Ford radio. Ford radio. So what if you couldn't afford it? What if you went to those neighbors or? Uh-huh. Yes, yeah. if your neighbor was poor, so we should have one. Let's yeah. impress so a little bit. Stayed on charge. Well, I relocated okay. here with my family. Oh, we live in a boxcar, and I don't know yet, I'm actually educated. Is it boxcar or a car box? Boxcar. 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 Literally a train boxcar, or is it, that's just what they're calling it? No, no. That's a fact. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Yeah. my family and I live in a boxcar along the side of the railroad track. My father was employed by Seaboard Airline Railway at the time, which is the trail now. Mm -hmm. And there were two sections in Largo, one for the Seaboard Airline Railway and one for the Coastline Railway. I believe the Coastline Railway is still here. Michael? Part of it. 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 So at that time, those two quarters housed, I guess, about seven or eight families. One was up in Largo, where, if you know the location, Largo Lumber Company is located mm -hmm. right there. And the other one was in what is known as the Ridgecrest area now. But in that general area, in the Ridgecrest area, there was only about a total of 10 black families in that area. And the city of Largo had what was called a black area and I guess about a dozen black families lived there, and that was located where the Coldwater High School is located now. Mm -hmm. So from that experience, we had to ride a school bus from there. We were, we we're fortunate to have a school bus to ride to school. Mm -hmm. But everyone from Seminole to Coldwater who was able to ride the bus was, was picked up and transported in that bus. And all you see out in Lago now, Ridgecrest, Ridgeview, all of those other places, 
simple as that again. So I spent the, ma the majority of my time you know, up here in Clearwater after I wanted to be out there six years. That's what existed at the time. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so uh, I think we went over the favorite entertainment and your choices. Were, were there specific radio programs that any, that any of you liked uh, oh, that you can yeah. remember that I were favorite? Shadow. Shadow, the shadow, everybody liked the shadow. Shadows, yeah. Yeah. The ball game. Ball game. Boxing. Sky Championship. Oh, Sky Kings and Radio? Yeah, was it the same people or? Sky King. Now, now I guess the yeah, kids the today don't even remember Sky King on television. Oh, they had this soap, so I too. Yeah, oh, they had soap. Yeah. 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 I didn't know that. Yeah. 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 Oh. Yeah. Any of the ones that are on television today or yeah. have been on? Was that on radio first? No. Not as any of the ones on I Yeah, radio, yeah, I remember then that, that one went to television. And I believe Dagwood and Blondie was on it. Yeah, Dagwood and Blondie show it. And what's that other one? The black. What's the guy named the Blondie? I'm going to ask you. And they're wrong. Yeah, it was an animal. I'm going to say that I missed the the music that you used to get. You see, Wings Over Jordan, the Fist Jubilee, oh, yeah, 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 the, all the, the um, singers that you used to hear, the music was, I mean, excellent. Okay. Beautiful music. You don't see, you don't even see it on TV much then. If any of you as the audience would like to participate or else ask questions or, or interject something, please, 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 please go ahead. Oh. <laughs> oh, my what were the educational opportunities, or rather employment opportunities available to black women right after the, um, the Second World War? Was it hard to get a job? I mean, Christine's been in my life since almost since we ever started. But, mm -hmm. but maybe too, do you know what the what the employment opportunities were available for black women at this time? Very slim. Very slim. I mean, you could get a job working as a maid. Mm -hmm. But why uh, as a job working mm -hmm. in a like as a teacher or something like that? Was that, was I don't, that difficult to bring into that? No, because we all had, had teachers and preachers. That's all <laughs> available to us. Uh, but if you went to college and got a degree, say, as a, as a teacher, could you come back to Clearwater and teach? And were you allowed to teach in the... Yeah. Sometimes they were gay school. Gay school. Gay school. Yeah. And another thing, when I came along, the school was still standing Curtis Elementary. Mm -hmm. They moved it from one place to another. Mm -hmm. The teacher that teachers at that time didn't have to have a, a four-year degree, not here in Clearwater. They took a test. And if they qualified, they were hired. That's been many, many years ago. Normal training is right. typical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. These are two year mm -hmm. hard topics. Mm -hmm. And while going on there, you could substitute with just high school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good, that kind. Did you have to teach in black schools or? Oh, or yeah. oh now, did, uh, you you know, so did, now, did white people then have to also teach in, in white schools, or were some of them they have to include the principal oh, administration? Two separate things. Two separate pay Two separate pay So what did you Can I continue? Oh yes, please go ahead. What was the impact on on busing back in the fifties? Was it hard to get there? Bus number one here. I went to school in the 50s, I finished mm -hmm. in 57. <laughs> but uh, during those times, mm -hmm. there were buses. Mm -hmm. And of course, the buses were designed far mm -hmm. for black or far white. You mm -hmm. had schools, but you were bused through. Mm -hmm. Pinellas served all of, uh, from Tarpon mm -hmm. to Seminole. To Seminole. To Seminole. To Seminole. Uh, so as far as I've had it there. All the other said Alamo. Osma. We went Osmar. to from Osma all the way yeah. down. Yeah. You know, then St. Pete would have carried the remainder for blood. Mm -hmm. There was one high school in either city, mm -hmm. and that's what happened. Where did Tarkin Spring go and all? Come here. Come here. Oh, everybody. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right out yeah. there where Discovery is now. Yeah, yeah. 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 all of us right mm -hmm. there. Where did the elementary? Where the elementary school? There was an elementary in Tarkin. Well, the, the old Curtis was with the elementary. Was with well, they well, had North Ward well, and South Ward. Well, yeah, oh, they all. They all of us had North Ward. Oh, they all did the elementary. Now, was there just elementary and then it went right, there was no junior high? 
Penelope had a seven. Penelope was a seven through twelve. Oh, I take that. See, I really read the paper. I read the paper. I read the paper. I know how to see the paper. How long was that? When did that change? That hasn't changed. It changed that I think about sixty-eight or sixty-nine. Oh, so it was that long. Huh. When, when busing came into it. See, when I, when I finished in 65, they were still busing. They were still busing for kids from, uh, from Top Point and everywhere. But to me, it was a good education, and uh, we had more uh, togetherness as a black community during the segregation era. And, and to me, I, I, I miss that now. You know, see, we had our own own identity, our own band. We used to have the biggest parade in the in, 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 in city. So when our band hit, hit Cleveland Street, it, all the... Uh, White guys and stuff, people, they came out of the offices, stood mm -hmm. around waiting on, we couldn't even get to the curb to see our own band. Mm -hmm. And that was our uh, homecoming every year. Mm -hmm. You know, I, to me, I missed that. I think that uh, integration took a loss of uh, the uh, togetherness from the black community and it um, spread our kids away from the family life. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm glad I came up at the time of the year right there. Now, were, were the administration and the teachers yeah. segregated that long too until the late 60s? Yes. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Really? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Six to nine. Yeah, I taught as a teacher for Dallas that I take the year at close that I went to to the evening. Six to nine. Now, did the pay scale also wait that long too? Difference? That was fine. A court case had already determined. Yes, in the fifties, I'm told that they became equalized. Now, now, does that also mean women teachers also got the same scale as they weren't? Okay. My parents. Good. Sometimes, you know. Any other questions? Um, Go ahead. Go over ahead to see you, Jan. Um, EJ addressed his early life when he came to Clemore, saying that you started out your life living in a boxcar, correct? Um, today we have all sorts of uh, opportunities for low income housing and minorities. Obviously, this did not exist 50 years ago. How did families moving new to the area, where did they settle? Was housing difficult for them to find? Was it affordable? Normally, a person relocating to this area from other areas did so by communicating with individuals that was here. And they knew if a house was vacant, then they would do something to have that reserved for the family that was coming down. And then a few was able to rebuild a makeshift home because there was no real restriction on construction at that time. So that's how they really migrated here. And then some of the what we call white landlords and slum lords turned out to be a provided housing for minorities. There's a lot of that occurred here in the North Greenway. And then they rented it to the minorities. And it was just like uh, uh, shotgun houses, we call them. Mm -hmm. You know, three rooms and you look in the front and right out of the back. <laughs> <laughs> wow, so that right. was better than what right. person had to afford because there was no electricity in a minority home. There is very few. Mm -hmm. And not to know inside plumbing. So, mm -hmm. so that came later. Now the school system, the principals more or less would be responsible for buying housing for the teachers that came. And they would be in private homes. And a lot of them I noticed when I came were uh, living in the housing project. That was, that was really the place for... Yeah, that once the great one was built. Yeah. Yeah, it was a car option. It was a It was not in private homes. Most of them were not in private homes. Even the black baseball players come train the field to stay in private homes in, in the North Greenwood area. Yeah. Well, my yeah. grandmother used to put up a baseball play every year and yeah. he to pay his rent. That they weren't allowed it. And, and all the white fellows stayed at Jack Carl Hotel. Right. They were not allowed. They weren't it. allowed. They couldn't even, they couldn't even, when they got through playing games, uh, spring training games, they wasn't allowed to go have a drink with the other white ball club. They had to come. Mm -hmm. Everything they did, they had to do on the North End Greenwood. Mm -hmm. they had, yeah. Did they have se separate, uh, uh, Leagues also too. I mean, no, it was, no, 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 no. It was just after, only on the games, and that was yeah. it. Yeah. 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 They were not allowed. Oh, Even with the Clearwater Bumble, when they go there. Well, as blacks, we had a little section. We had to go in. And we had a little gate that used to open up at night and let us in. <laughs> That's until the late 60s, even. Was, I, I, left, I left Clearwater in '65. Two, two days after I graduated yeah. from high school, and it was still, it was like that here. Mm -hmm. And it was. Uh, Bomb was the uh, world champion, yeah. and, it, and it was segregation. Yeah. You weren't allowed to do anything. Mm -hmm. Now, EJ, you were talking about how did you get permission to live in the boxcar? Was it just there and nobody stopped you, or was it set? Was it adapted to live in, or was it just an empty boxcar? Okay, these like boxcars were petitioned off by, I guess, the railroad company for the 
employees to live in. Mm -hmm. So that's that's how you got it. Yes. Were they at least brought down, or did they still have the wheels and everything? No, they were taken off the wheels, and it was on. It was just petition off, and that was it. One petition. And everything in. That's all. Just yeah. one petition. Wow. Essentially, had a makeshift lean-to porch on the front, mm -hmm. and that was it. Mm -hmm. There was no running water inside. There was no front yeah. facilities. Outhouse. Now, did you have like one big outhouse for all the whole community in that area? Or a couple? No, or just I believe I'm correct in saying that it's probably one for two families. families. Mm -hmm. Right, something like that. It wasn't really wow. one community yeah. type situation. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, you know, um, Ms. Christine, Ms. Morris is not saying it, but when I come in and I look at this library compared to the one that we had on the corner of Palmetto and Pennsylvania, um, Ms. Christine did the best with what she had and it was very not much, no. you know, and I'm not putting down the arrangement of the library, but, but we went in and there was no noise. I mean, Ms. Christine had it that, I mean, I was sent out the door a many times and brought back in to do my work, you know, but the kids here, you know, just run around with noise, 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 you know, you come in and I looked at all these books. You know, and we didn't have, we had whatever the big library sent. And I mean, it was raggedy books, but but what we had, you know, Miss Chris always made sure that you were well read. You know what I mean, with the material that was there. You know, and we checked out books. I mean, it was, well, like I say, they were hand-me-downs, the last mm -hmm. of the stock. But, you know, you compare it to now, you know, what, this this library is compared to that little box car, well, car box or whatever, <laughs> that little storefront on the corner of yeah, Palmetto in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Believe me. Could I ask one thing for participants, since especially since we're filming this, would you please say your names oh, if you have questions or something? You are going to be on film, and otherwise years from now they're going to say, well, who in the world was that, and who were they that they'd ask that? What is your name? Sorry about that. My name is Elnora Keith. Thank you. Great. Great. Yeah. Uh, do you oh, think, though, in, on that interjection, I asked our panel and our, our company, do you think that back then you had more support from parents and, and the law or something yes. where you could discipline kids and or parents yes. did and you could tell, unlike nowadays when there's so many laws against you and so many parents don't su support, not necessarily intentionally, but they're both working, do you think that could be part of the problem? Yeah, that's a great deal. Yeah, it is a great deal. Yeah. Yeah. My, assessment, my, my assessment of that, you don't have the same pride in kids today. Mm -hmm. Pride and respect mm -hmm. in kids today as kids had in those days. The parent and teachers have been crumpled by what they can do today mm -hmm. by the law. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm to gain discipline from the children. So the children, they got to worry about it mm -hmm. by, by the, the, the yeah. handle. Yeah. So as I see it, that loss of true dedication by the kids and the parents and teachers not having liberty to discipline kids have caused many serious problems, as mm -hmm. I see it. Mm -hmm. Because it's lost. Mm -hmm. That's, I think, a good thing to interject to know is how was it back then? How was it in school with discipline, listening to the teachers, you know, listening to administration? What would happen if you didn't listen to the teachers? to me in high school, and I, and I was, uh, <laughs> was what Ken and Doc can tell you, I was a troublemaker. I, I, I just did what, you know, I raised a little saying at Panos High School. But <laughs> you, pay, you paid for it. Mm -hmm. You know, you went to the office, and uh, Professor Curtis and Dr. Rooks and all, and the teachers, they whip you. I got many whoopings. And, and, uh, and also, when you left school, you your parent knew when you got home that you did something, and you got another whooping. And see, mm -hmm. in my family, the worst thing you could do is let grandmama whoop you, because you got a whooping. <laughs> see? So, you know, and I got a lot of Lois Martin has a question. Uh, yes, well, not a question, but uh, I think I look at what's going on now and what. Um, when I was going to school, which was years ago, we had separate but equal schools in my hometown from West Virginia. Uh, I was uh, I went to school and graduated from high school in West Virginia, and uh, which was different. Uh, West Virginia is a little different from the solid South they used to call it because it's a 
Yeah, West Virginia. West Virginia. Yeah, West Virginia. West Virginia. Yeah. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I'll tell you, you my down, story. You down south. <laughs> I was up in the northern panhandle of West Virginia, but to me, the the dislocation of parents and uh, the way society is was after the Second World War. I think when the women went out of the home, the you didn't have that. Uh, togetherness and I blame I, right now I, I get so upset with churches because we went to church we had a program we went to church and the church and the ministers and the people in the church communicated with the teachers and the teachers in the home and it was a different it was a close at closeness and neighborliness you know and when people say to me, well, you know, uh, it's because one family home, oh, please. My mother had eight kids, and my father died early. And believe me, it could have been any stricter. We had, we had limits, and we knew them. To sit down, uh, what we were supposed to do, and we didn't do it. We knew what the result was going to be, you know. So it isn't, it, but it was because in the community, people work together and and help you raise your kids too, because if a neighbor saw you doing it, I was one lady I just hated, because it looked like every time I got into something, she was there. And I'm going to take your man, she said. I don't want to tell. And, um, but it was it was just so it's so different. I think we could do a little bit more, and I think the churches could do a little bit more too today to help the parents and the teachers, you know, work together. But you know, one thing I found out um, that has bothered me through the years when they took prayer out of the stage. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. That it's right. Yeah. Those, um, Throwed a monkey or uh, mm -hmm. something. It does, nothing was the same anymore. And I feel like the schools were founded uh, in churches mm -hmm. and prayer. Mm -hmm. And uh, not until we, as citizens, come back to that, we really have lost a lot of our ground. We, uh, we as black, only thing that we knew about mm -hmm. other than home was in church. Mm -hmm. Maybe and we were founded on that. I mean, we were really founded on mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Uh, let, let me say a word about that. You know that um, long years ago, when I was a boy, my family was of 12 children. And the children were obedient because the family was more together mm -hmm. and more stricter on the children. Now, that the families don't have time to bother with their children and they expect the schools and the churches to do the things that they should have done at home. And until they realize that and go back and train, put into their child what the Lord has told them to do, then it was going to be just like this, it's going to be worse because over 60, 65% of the young people now are boys and young ladies are in the chain gang. And back in those days, that didn't happen. Yeah, I share that too. Really? I share that. I've talked on a family club too. Inside, I guess. But you know, one of the things, I'm in schools, have been for a long time, but I'm totally opposed to prayers in school. And the reason I am, because when I see who's teaching, I want to know who's praying. Mm -hmm. What are you teaching in prayer? I don't want a Hindu person to teach prayer to my child. I don't want a uh, Muslim to teach prayer to my child. I want my proud child to pray as I want, as I believe. So when you say I want to pray in school, you're saying whoever's out there teach prayer. And I'm totally opposed to that. We had prayer in school, but I knew who was praying. And I knew what they were praying. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. But in today's world and in my economy, I've got about 50 to 60 different people of different things on my staff. And many of those I'm totally opposed to. Personally, mm -hmm. that's their right to practice, but don't practice on my child. Mm -hmm. You practice your craft of 
whatever your specialty is in teaching, but don't practice religion. I agree with you. And maybe because both being parent and educator, but too much have, ha has been advocated to the school. Thus, some lawyers may mention a good point. The church, school, and all work together. And now all of a sudden, all of this has been thrust upon the school. My school is called a full service school because when a kid gets to school, he gets anything from a psychological to, ever, to a meal and everything else. Well, my gosh, where is a parent to do something? And then you wonder why he can't read because we're too busy taking care of physical and psychological needs. It, it becomes such a big issue. The difference, I think, in communities, I think, look at our whole system when we came up and there was a togetherness of community. There was a commonness of purpose. Who are your neighbors now? We are so diverse in our society that we are, you know, I have my little group of kids and uh, say what we want about the kids. But many of us, don't you dare say anything to my child. We don't want teachers to do anything in rearing kids anymore, let alone neighbors. Matter of fact, many of us don't rear them anymore. We just let them go. You know, the whole concept of a latch key. Put a key around his neck and you go out and you come back. So that's the kind of society and that's the kind of kid who's growing up who number one reason for leaving school, nobody cares. Number one reason for almost many of the things, they don't care about me. Now, some, some, of, some, of the, some of the things you're talking about it's caused by the economy too, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. uh, now where I taught in, in Holland, both parents had to work just for survival, and survive and survive for their kids. You know? and, and them, those parents being out may or may not have made a difference in the kind of kid that would have come along. That's true, but uh, uh, we just have to look at what's what, and we as black people don't get. Uh, except in the professions, maybe the same kind of money to support our families, you know, as as the uh, white people do. That's true. It, it, and it's it's it's. I mean, that's just facts. It's You're true, right. but it's also uh, facts. What do you do with the money you get? You know, I'm also hard to the point. Also, time well, in terms of oh, well, in terms of, a, <laughs> in terms of priority. In terms of priority. Until I teach my kid what's important, I don't care how much money, you know, until he learns that the $130 pumps are not as important as buying something else. It's not money sometimes as much as it is a priority of value. See, when I, when I, when I grew up as a kid on, in Greenwood, I think the first job I had was about 12 or 13. And I had to go up on Clearwater Beach every day and cut yards for my uncle when he was sick. And I went at, when he when his payday when his, the white lady gave me the check I took it home to my grandmother, and at the end of the summer, Martha gave me five dollars, and to me that was a million dollars. But I had to do it because they said it had to be done. Because mm -hmm. Uncle was sick, somebody had to do it. I was the oldest grandson, and it was my responsibility. And so I learned what hard work. I learned how to value money, and that's all I ever knew. You know, and for like when one time when I was a kid, Booker Teller had a store on Greenwood. Mm -hmm. I went there one day trying to get a pack of cookies. And Miss Teller see me and she said, Won't put in your grandma's bill. I got scared. <laughs> Mr. Teller beat me. My grandmother beat me. And from then on I knew you don't take stuff that belongs to other people. And you know, this was instilled in me and, and, and when they told you to be somewhat, my mother raised seven of us over in Greenwood Apartments. And when she left in the morning to go to work, mm -hmm. we, I got my sister and them read, my younger brother and them read, and everybody went to school. I got out of Pineville High School, I went back home, and I, when mom left to go back to the white people's house at six o'clock to cook something for them, we all had to be in the house mm -hmm. till she get home. Then when she came home, it was too dark, too late for us to go out. We had a little TV, but at 8 o'clock, you either did, had your homework done, you was on your way to bed. One stand up, you know, 10, 11 o'clock, so you don't watch what you want to watch or whatever, because when she put the TV on the program, that's the channel to stay on. You didn't have a choice. you didn't have a choice. See, nowadays, if you put a TV on, the kid get remote control, but my little grandbaby do it. She did remote control and turn to what she wanted to turn to. You know, it, during them time, we, we, we said, what mom and them said, that was the golden rule. And to me, no, like mom would say, she might be wrong, but still, she was my mother. <laughs> Don't care how old she said I got, she, she, she was a hated person. Do you have a question or comment? No, I have a comment. You know, if we would only look back to what was said about the radio and TV, 
the radio, the TV has educated our, our kids. The TV has also taken our parenthood away because the parents um, have VCRs, most of them now, and they program their, their soapies. So when they come home, they don't have time for Billy or Johnny. Johnny automatically watch TV. And if the parent, back to what Mr. Robinson said, if the, the parents' hands are tired as far as the law is concerned, back then if, if I didn't do my work, you know, my mother put, put blisters on me. I mean, I had scars. Nobody said anything, but it made me know that the next time you do what you have to do. You know, but now parents don't have time. They watch their TV. The children also know that if my mother beat me, I'm gonna call 911. See, so mother is afraid in a way to hit that child. And then that child goes astray. Then they send it to school and it says, well, okay, you all do it because I can't do it. And that's not the way it was right. You know, we were raised. We were raised, you know, as Ron said, in the project, everybody knew everybody and everybody knew you know what you have to do and I was beat uh, many times by neighbors and killed by my mother because <laughs> they beat you and your mother killed you mm -hmm. right. yeah, but I'm saying you know you can't do it now you know I mean you, you in fact you have to be careful what you even say to kids in the store because if I you know say don't do this with a you know a outraged voice Mr. Robinson will come and say, well now, you know better than that. Or either maybe he'll call the police. Yeah. See, and that, that, that's where it is. And you know, as far as, I, I mean, I feel in a sense that the school system is fine, but um, <laughs> it has taken away from, from what we grew up in at Pinellas High School. Mm -hmm. um, the average black child wants to play football, basketball, and all of these sports. They're at East Lake. Their parents don't have a car, or their parents get off so late, so that child cannot participate in all of these things. So it's taking your identity away from you, you know, unless you've got transportation to go, you know, these different places. And, and the average parents get off from, from, from work. They are not gonna travel all the way to East Lake to watch their child play basketball when we have the schools here. You know, to some, they may say, well, you know, uh, integrating the schools is a good thing. In a sense, maybe yes, you know, quote unquote. But in a sense, it has taken our identity away from our black kids. I'm saying. Mm -hmm. yeah. So Sarah or Jan, one of either of you have questions? I saw both your hands up. I just have a question for Christine. Um, I'm Jan. One of our goals in libraries in working with children is to try and get kids in the library. We don't really care that much what they read as long as they read. If we can get them hooked on reading, that is the door toward a future of lifelong learning. And I have heard legends about Christine gathering all these kids in the library and keeping them there and getting them interested in activities and reading. Um, my association with the Clearwater Library has been to look at pictures of Christine and her library and it was packed with children. One, how did you do that? And two, what advice do you have for this particular neighborhood from back when you were a library to where it is today that we can change things and get kids back in the libraries and in the library? That's a lot, huh? <laughs> you can't do it because you can't yeah. thread them like she How did you get them? Well, I don't know. I did it. You threaded us. <laughs> One of the re I I tried hard to instill in the mind when they come into the library. I know all the times you can't have a solid library, mm -hmm. but some of the times you need to have uh, some type of activity. Mm -hmm. And I was instrumental in uh, like Curtis Elementary School. Mm -hmm. I worked with the teachers and also the librarian mm -hmm. and the head starts mm -hmm. and tried to get those children in the library. I sent cards home for the parents to fill out. Mm -hmm. And that is one of that was one of the reasons why I had the community involved. And when we had summer programs, mm -hmm. I would always try to pull on both white and black, like the Daskalogias, mm -hmm. you know, that uh, is part of my great niece's uh, founders. And we, it was just something I could, I got, 
I don't know, maybe it was charisma or something, <laughs> but I was always to get the children here. I don't know why, but they would, they would obey me, and I would always tell them, I said, now be quiet, be quiet, or uh, whatever. I and I didn't mean any harm. I didn't mean any harm, but I felt like it, there should be obedience in the library and uh, keep themselves quiet. And another thing I used to do, I saw some pictures of the other day. I used to sit, not in, where are they? Not these tables, but I used to sit right in this circle here and have maybe eight or nine children read to them. Mm -hmm. And after I finished reading, a lot of them would say, I'd like to check that book out. And that was another. But the kids did not have as many options. Right, right. And mm -hmm. that was my yeah. second question. Yeah. What did yeah. children yeah. have to do for activities back mm -hmm. 30 years ago? It's right there, the library. Come to the library. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Are you a home or something uh -huh. like that? Mm -hmm. yeah. And another thing, see, there's so many, they have all of these new type of the games game. on the room at home. Yeah. Yeah. Nintendo's and, yeah. 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 and, yeah. and, and, Tendos so and uh, different types of skates they have. Mm -hmm. And they have other outlets. You take maybe 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. So much has come about. Mm -hmm. I really wish that more children would read. I do. Because mm -hmm. uh, the reading is, is a world mm -hmm. of trouble. You can go all over the United States, travel mm -hmm. with reading. Mm -hmm. But uh, and another thing I found out that some of the parents then would read to the children at home, where in nine, the parents don't have the time. Right. They both are working or as a single parent, and they say, oh, go on about your business, I don't have time. And that should be another thing. I, I put some of the blame on the parents, but not instilling in those children. Mm -hmm. we, we, we just don't have that thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, like, let me tell you, whatever, all the other families, mm -hmm. you can mention to you, but, but I think the key is that family unit. Mm -hmm. It has to stop. Something. It was a very popular one for Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, unless we don't have that now, unless we can recall that. The women, the, the, women, the, the women was more of an influence in the family That's when I grew up. Cause see, I, I would say my grandmother, she was like the hatred of the family. Everything happened, it revolved around my grandmother. I told so from my uncles or whatever, nobody did anything unless grandmama okayed it. She, would, she ran it with, she was, you know, that's the way it was. The women, you mind. You know, I came from a single family home. My mother raised seven of them. But her word her, 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 her was the law, you know, but yeah. I knew her. And see, in a lot of instances, the men were the breadwinners. They were working, and the, and the ladies were praying at home. And they did a good job. Like but what might happen that our kids can't read? Uh, because to me, this is what's hap what has happened to the kids. I mean, when I was teaching, I had to do my uh, lessons not with the books, because they couldn't read the books that we bought mm -hmm. from, uh, from Barnes sure. & Noble. Uh, they, they were so and they were so frustrated. So I had to redo to a simpler presentation to the kids so they could understand and do what I tell. But it isn't just it isn't just one location. It's all the United States. Oh, kids yeah. can't oh, read. It happens that the kids can't read. Because the read. teachers don't take the time. It, no, not only no, the no, no, it's not no, a, I blame the parents. No, I'll tell you what. It's not look, at, look at the options. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things in the classroom now, compared to the world of students a kid lives in, probably the most important thing he does, and boring in the sense of reading, a teacher, quote, reciting through teacher, because everything else is colorful, games on TV, everything else, it's, it's a world. It's a world of sound, of sight, of seeing. Teacher reading. Everything you could teach reading to, you got the uh, converse that says, but you don't have to read. I got a verbal, I got an oral presentation of everything, so there are all kind of options. So if you can't read it, good. Somebody can recite it for you, so you can do it so many other ways. You still should read. You ought to know how to read. Yeah, it's essential. Mr. It's Harris, very, uh, I don't want, I, no, I agree with you. Yeah, oh, I agree no with you 100%. And things like that, you know. I agree with you 100%. Just read and see how many uh, um, recipes or anything that you have I to agree with you 100%. do that has a, a direction 
Yeah. Oh. If you can't reach, you're That's handicapped. Exactly right. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. That's something we can say to the Greenwood neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the office a little. Sarah, Sarah? I wanted to um, uh -oh. ask the panel, <laughs> each, it, ask if each panel member could respond to a couple of things. One is, um, what was the most meaningful advice you've ever gotten that have helped you to get where you are and who gave it to you? What was the most times, one of the most pleasant times you spent in Clearwater? Pleasant times? <laughs> yes, pleasant, good times. Uh, well, good times, any way you want to define that, Dr. Harris. Yeah, I'll start with one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I guess you, you asked, if I remember, if I remember correctly, what was the most meaningful thing that occurred that caused the change? Yes. I guess my uh, military experience was the turnaround for me. I was fortunate enough to be drafted along with Carol Evans, David Welch, and St. Petersburg, who you may not know. From this particular area. The company that I was assigned to overseas only had 138 individuals. In and I would think it's safe to say that perhaps 75% of those individuals either was going off to college or was in college, whatever the case may be. But being there with them and with them talking about what they were going to do when they returned home made me take a good look at myself. I asked myself, what are you going to do when you get home? Based on that, I could not afford to come back and do the same thing that I was doing prior to home. So I made a commitment to myself that I was going to do whatever I could under the GI Bill to improve myself. So I came out, I enrolled in school, and I was out of the military. And after being enrolled in school, uh, I got assistance from individuals who just kind of walked up. In fact, I got architectural design from a white architect in St. Petersburg who saw some drawings that I was doing. I took a uh, private lesson from a professional engineer in Harvard, in Harvard Hill, Harvard in my road. So those are the kinds of things that helped me, help change my life to be a more productive person. I just thought I'd share it. Um, I left home when I was 13 years old. Uh, my mother and father was, they were very strict people on, on the children. And they tried to teach them the way of life that which they were meet as they grew up. So when I went in the army, I was only in the fifth grade. And wasn't a very good reader even at that. Because back in those days, um, if you stayed in one grade too long, they would pass you where you could read or know. Reading that was the wrong thing to do. And so finally in the army, I was overseas and uh, I get letters from home. And there was some of the things I could read and some things in there I couldn't read. Then I got to go get somebody else to read it from me. And that was very embarrassing to me. So I made up my mind that um, I was going to try to go to school if I got out of the army alive. I prayed to the Lord that he would help me. So when I was discharged, that was the first thing I did when I got back to the States. I came to Clearwater, and this wasn't the place that I wanted to live. So I stayed there for a while and so I decided to leave. I left and went to Kansas City. And I picked up the GI Bill and I went to school. Alright, I went to school in Canada for about, know, about seven months. And so I left there and I came back to uh, a little place called Wild Cold. And I went over to Daytona Beach over to Soon cut and call it. I would work in the daytime and I would go to school at night. I taken up educational, I went to school for diesel mechanic, I taken up copy, and I taken up brick mason. 
and I went to school for five years, and that's how I got uh, where I am today. Because if I hadn't of them, I wouldn't have been able to make it. Uh, what you question me about uh, the advice, I think the uh, best advice I ever had was when I got ready to leave Clearwater in 65, two days after I grew up in high school, my grandmother called me to the house and she told me, she said, now, you grew up in Clearwater, you're going up, I'm going to Hartford, Connecticut to my aunt, older sister, and she said, now, you treat everybody, regardless of their color, as you want to be treated. <coughs> and she said, if you do that, you would never have any problem getting along with anybody. And I think, looking back, I've always tried to follow that because growing up here in Clearwater in a segregated community as I did as a kid, I had lots of bad feelings and bad experience, but I always tried to think about what grandmama told me. And when I got to Connecticut, I seen a different, it wasn't a black or white issue when I got up north in 65. At 17, I didn't know what a Polak was, what a Jew was, what an Italian was. All I knew you were white too, white, black you were black. All right. you know. And then uh, the first job I had up there, I worked for a newspaper company, uh, Hartford Times, I was a salesman. And I was amazed, you know, at the different how people treated you because of your nationality. It wasn't because you were black or white, it was just they didn't like you whatever you was. <laughs> and so I always look back on what my grandma said, it was good advice, and I always try to keep it and in, 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 in use it even today. Because I've had lots of money, even now, I, you know, you, you still go back, you regret sometimes, people do something, you think about the bad times. Because Clearwater has changed, but it's still a long ways from being right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the best advice I can, um, and of course all of my advice was good, okay? Because I came along during that time. And you listen, but my parents would, I mean almost like a daily ritual, say you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be at the top of your class, but whatever you do, do your best. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, they will run it down. Like, even if you want, if you choose to be a ditch digger, mm -hmm. be the best ditch mm -hmm. digger. And, and I heard that so much until it really became a part of me. And from interpreting that, whatever I did, I tried to excel. I, I, I didn't try to, to make all A's. I didn't try to become president of the United States. But, but that stayed with me. Whenever I took a task, I always tried to do the best. Now the, um, I won't say favorite experience, but the most rewarding experience I've had since I've been in Clearwater, one of the most. Uh, I integrated King Sowery Elementary. <laughs> and, and, and that was an experience. Uh, believe it or not, uh, color was not an issue. Uh, for many days, it just never dawned upon me that I had integrated King Sowery. Uh, everybody was cooperative. I was caught, and of course, um, I realized that um, I was in a mirror. And I never forgot that. Um, but that was no problem. There again, I did my best, and I think it worked out all right. Um, the next year, and this is the punchline. The next year, uh, they decided to pair Kane's Highway, which was all white, with Pear Meadow, which was all black. And of course, uh, this was near the end of the uh, first year that uh, the school board had announced this. And uh, the next day after it came on the uh, evening news, my class walked in and They were looking at me from head to toe. Mm -hmm. they, they were seeing me for the first time was when, when it came out. And that, and that was very interesting. And I mean, they made comments, you know, about uh, we, we're going to have such and such a people in our school next year. Did you hear? 
and, and the conversation went, and this was the interesting part for me, the conversation went to the point that uh, I decided that we needed to talk about it because there were so many misconceptions going around. And we stopped at one point during the day and started talking about it. And would you believe, this was the interesting part about it, they were telling me all of these things that they had been told about blacks. And of course they had been told because it was obvious they had no experience. And, and I listened and I allowed them to finish. And when they finished, I said, uh, you know, I'm one of those people you're talking about? And they looked at me and said, but you're different. Mm -hmm. No, I'm not different. You know, this, this is your conception. And then I went down their list of what they were saying the blacks were. I named one of them that fitted each one of those descriptions. Mm -hmm. And so I said, now you see, this is not, this is not a racial thing. And I went on to tell them how privileged they were, how honored they were, because I was there and I could give them a first-hand account of these rumors that uh, mm -hmm. had been going around. And uh, that they are. Family law is really important to me. As a matter of fact, the way came with very close to their family. And, uh, I think that family pride, family values is still being the best that you can be. Uh, the attitude of uh, don't take any wooden nipples. Be assured of yourself, know what you are, and do that. And I think that uh, each of us are came out of our uh, home life with that kind of attitude. You know, as we moved and grew and what have you, we were basically, I guess, sufficient in the, to, to the extent that what we did, we did well, we did with pride. My dad had a big habit of saying he was just over and shaved in his name. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he was just very proud of Cousin Harris. <laughs> 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 he was really proud. He was proud of Cousin Harris. He was proud of his children. He'll let you know who they were. And if you saw his kids doing whatever, you just tell him. And that took care of it. When you grow up with that sense of, I want to succeed. Mm -hmm. I want to. And you know, it was, it's, we really appreciate it because even during the hard times, his attitude, as you said, roles were very well defined. Mm -hmm. My mother stayed home the, until the last one got out in school, and then she started work. He took care of us. And as long as you're doing school, something's going to help you. I want you better than I am. That was the philosophy at home. Mm -hmm. You study, you do this, you, you do that. You don't want to do anything, you work. And it's peculiar because as we went through, almost all of us just went on through and took that education around. Maybe we were just lazy, I don't know, but, <laughs> but we did. But the attitude, I want, I expect more from you, and I want a life for you much better than was ever for me. And I think that's that heritage and pride that we still need to instill through our kids. As the rest of the uh, the all the family has said, my parents was my motivator. Uh, as I said in my first statement, we came here in 1926 from the very, very small city in Register, Georgia. And my uncle was the first black cab driver in this area. And uh, when he came back to Georgia, he told my father, these are the words that I have I heard during my parents' lifetime. Eddie, I would like for you to take those children from this city and carry them to Clearwater because the opportunities would be greater in the long run. So we left Georgia, very, very small town, and we came, and the house that we were brought to and lived is still standing today. It's facing Pennsylvania now. At the time, it was facing Carlton Street. We lived there with my grandmother until my father could find a place for us to move. And it was from a child growing up. I had a very, very stern father when he said, do this, don't ask him the second time. I, we received very, very few beatings like you know, that time, those days, we were, we didn't get beaten. It was always, you do this first. Don't ask the second time. 
picking up the GI Bill and I went to school. All right, I went to school in Canada for um, about, from about seven months. And so I left there and I came back to uh, a little place called Wild Cold. And I went over to Daytona Beach, over to Thune Cutting College. I would work in the daytime and I would go to school at night. I taken up educational. I went to school for diesel mechanic. I taken up coffee. And I taken up brick mason. And I went to school for five years. And that's how I got uh, where I am today. Because if I had no them, I wouldn't have been able to make it. Uh, with equipment, but uh, the advice, I think the uh, best advice I ever had was when I got ready to leave Clearwater in 65, two days after I grew up in high school, my grandmother called me to the house and she told me, she said, now, you grew up here in Clearwater, you're going up, I was going to Hartford, Connecticut to my aunt, older sister, and she said, now, you treat everybody, regardless of their color, as you want to be treated. And she said, if you do that, you would never have any problem getting along with anybody. And I think, Looking back, I've always tried to follow that because growing up here in Clearwater in a segregated community as I did as a kid, I had lots of bad feelings and bad experience, but I always tried to think about what grandmama told me. And when I got to Connecticut, I seen a different, it wasn't a black or white issue when I got up north in 65. At 17, I didn't know what a Polak was, what a Jew was, what an Italian was. All I knew you were white too, white, black you. <laughs> you know, and then uh, the first job I had up there, I worked for a newspaper company, uh, Harper Times. I was a salesman, and I was amazed, you know, at the different how people treated you because of your nationality. It wasn't because, because you were black or white; it just they didn't like you, whatever you was. <laughs> and so I always look back on what my grandma said; it was good advice, and I always try to keep it and in, 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 in use it even today, because I've had lots of money even now. You know, you, you still go back, you regret sometimes, people do something, you think about the bad times. Because Clearwater has changed, but it's still a long ways from being right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the best advice I can call, and of course all of my advice is good, okay? Because I came along during that time, and you listen, but my parents were, almost like a daily ritual say you don't have to be perfect you don't have to be at the top of your class but whatever you do do your best thing and, and I mean they will run it down like even if you want if you choose to be a ditch digger mm -hmm. be the best ditch mm -hmm. digger and and I heard that so much until it really became a part of me and from interpreting that whatever I did, I tried to excel. I, I, I didn't try to, to make all A's. I didn't try to become president of the United States. But, but that stayed with me. Whenever I took a task, I always tried to do the best. Now the, um, I won't say favorite experience, but the most rewarding experience I've had since I've been in Clearwater, one of them, uh, I integrated King Sally Elementary. <laughs> and that, I, that was an experience. Uh, believe it or not, uh, color was not an issue. Uh, for many days, it just never dawned upon me that I had integrated King Sally. Uh, everybody, was cooperative, I was cordial, and of course, um, I realized that um, I was in a mirror, and I never forgot that. Um, but that was no problem. There again, I did my best, and I think it worked out all right. Um, the next year, and this is the punchline, the next year, uh, they decided to pair Kane's Highway, which was all white, with Pear Meadow, which was all black. And of course, uh, this was near the end of the uh, first year that uh, the school board had announced this. And 
The next day after it came on the um, evening news, my class walked in and they were looking at me from head to toe. <laughs> they, they were seeing me for the first time was what, what it came out. And that, and that was very interesting. And I mean, they made comments, you know, about uh, we, we're going to have such and such a people in our school next year. Did you hear? And, and the conversation went, and this was the interesting part to me, the conversation went to the point that uh, I decided that we needed to talk about it because there were so many misconceptions going around. And we stopped at one point during the day and started talking about it. And would you believe this was the interesting part about it? They were telling me all of these things that they had been told about blacks. And of course they had been told because it was obvious they had no experience. And, and I listened and I allowed them to finish. And when they finished, I said, uh, you know, I'm one of those people you're talking about? And they looked at me and said, but you're different. Mm -hmm. No, I'm not different. You know, this, this is your conception. And then I went down their list of what they were saying the blacks were. I named one of them that fitted each one of those descriptions. And so I said, now you see, this is not, this is not a racial thing. And I went on to tell them how privileged they were, how honored they were, because I was there and I could give them a first-hand account of these rumors that uh, had been going around. And from that day on, a good relationship. Family law is really important to me. As a matter of fact, the way came from very close to family. And uh, I think that family pride, family values is still being the best that you can be. Uh, the attitude of uh, don't take any good news. Be assured of yourself, know what you are, and do that. And I think that uh, each of us are came out of our, our home life with that kind of attitude. You know, as we moved and grew and what have you, we were basically, I guess, sufficient in the, to, to the extent that what we did, we did well, we did with pride. My dad had a big hat of saying, so he just don't bring shame to his name. Okay. He, was, he was just very proud of Gus Harris. He was really proud. He was proud of Gus Harris, and he's proud of his children. He'll let you know who they were. And if you saw his kids doing whatever, you just tell him, and that took care of it. When you grow up with that sense of, I want to succeed, I want to. And you know, it's, it's, we really appreciate it because even during the hard times, his attitude, as you said, roles were very well defined. Mm -hmm. My mother stayed home to, until the last one got out in school and then she started work. He took care of us. And as long as you're doing school, something's going to help you. I want you better than I am. That was the philosophy at home. Mm -hmm. You study, you do this, you, you do that. You don't want to do anything, you work. And it's peculiar because as we went through, almost all of us just went on through and took that education around. Maybe we were just lazy, I don't know. But, <laughs> but we did. But the attitude, I want, I expect more from you. And I want a life for you much better than for Zelda for me. And I think that's that heritage and pride that we still need to instill to our kids. As the resident of the all the panel has said, my parents was my motivator. Uh, as I said in my first statement, we came here in 1926 from the very, very small city in Register, Georgia. And my uncle was the first black cab driver in this area. And uh, when he came back to Georgia, he told my father, these are the words that I have I heard during my parents' lifetime. Eddie, I would like for you to take those children from this city and carry them to Clearwater because I, the opportunities would be greater in the long run. So we left Georgia, very, very small town, <laughs> and we came, and the house that we were brought to and lived is still standing today. It's facing Pennsylvania now. At the time, it was facing Carlton Street. We lived there with my grandmother until my father 
the time and place for us to move. And it was from a child growing up. I had a very, very stern father when he said, do this, don't ask him the second time. I, we received very, very few beatings, like, you know, that time. Those days, we, were, we didn't get beatings. It was always, you do this firm. Don't ask the second time. You know to get up and do it. And they always, my mother and my father, my mother stayed home until my youngest sister was old enough to go to school. My father worked for the WPA, helped build all of this out here. During the Roosevelt time, he would come home, eat, rest, and go to the pressing club. He was also a pioneer of this area. And uh, it was always said, do the best you can with what you have. And try to have an impact on your family, don't make me shame. And I feel like that uh, being reared here, coming here very small, like maybe a seven, or maybe a thousand, fifteen hundred families in this area, this whole black area, it wasn't that many. And this area was built of uh, grapefruit trees, tangerine trees orange trees. So that was what the most of the people made their living from, picking oranges. As I said before, they named the grove, G-R-O-V-E, was not North Greenwood. It was G-R-O-V-E. And that, I think this is where part of that name came from, because it was so many fruit trees in this area. And my family actually had an impact on me, my parents. And uh, the most rewarding was when I received this job working for the city of Stillwater. There were several applications in. I was interviewed, I never shall forget, July the 7th, 1948. I never shall forget the date. And at that time, there was no such thing as uh, a black person could go to the main library. They wanted the library into the North Greenwood at that time, the North Greenwood area, but there was no one pushing for it. Some of the people that was on the panel, they are deceased now, like Dr. Reverend Armstrong and Mrs. Portia Jackson is still living, Mr. Carson. They're the ones that pushed so far a branch to be out in this area. And then after I received the job, I was the chief bottle washer. <laughs> I was everything. <laughs> and um, then I was also on the steering committee to move that library to another place that was more adequate. And they wanted to take it further to Curtis Elementary. And I, I really stamped to not take it there. And I asked them if there was any other type, any other city land that they could uh, build on. I'll put something more centrally located. And they went back and they, they knew all the time. And all of a sudden we came up with this particular area. And that was uh, this uh, receiving and being, throwing one of the shovels of dirt for this branch to be built. It really made me feel good after I had fought so hard. And uh, surprisingly, some of the things that you could hear, you know. Mm -hmm. And then at that time, Mary Steerheim was the city manager. No, it wasn't Mary Steerheim. Mr. James Stewart was the city manager. He stood exactly where that exit is, and he told the people that were here that day that I would like to see everything in this branch, this downtown. I want all the best books that can be bought. I want the best chairs. I don't want anybody to walk in here and say that we don't have a good branch. When we moved into this branch, there were white families all around. And the children, they had children. 
and they would come to the door and I guess they looked at me and they saw my face was black and I was smiling and one of the little girls said to me, she said, is this a colored library? I said, does it look like a colored library? <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, it's for everyone. It's a branch of the main library. Are you willing? I said, you're perfectly welcome to come, read the books, read the magazines, or whatever. I said, it's for you to enjoy and check out books. I didn't have any problems when we moved into this area. When they found out it was not a colored library, <laughs> when they found out it was a library for all people. So those were some of the most important things right here. Thank you very much. Uh, I know uh, Mr. Robinson is here. Mrs. Hodges, neither of you can be with us tomorrow. So for, first of all, I'd like to ask you if you have anything else to share with us. I'd also like to interject, I know at least two of you were in the military, and if you could try to quickly say um, how it was. Was it segregated that both of you were in the military? Was it, uh, was it separate? I know at one time it was, or was it integrated then at that time, and you had no problems? Um, well, until I went overseas, uh, they didn't live together in the same barrack. But, um, on the front line, there was no difference. <laughs> but the barracks, you were separated. Uh, no, uh, the barracks, the barracks was. The barracks was. Yeah, you had black, and then you had white. <laughs> but on the front line, you, you got side by side. There was no difference. Mm -hmm. And after the war, when you came back to the state, then there was a difference. Mm -hmm. But they fought. Was there an attitude between anything, or was it? Is it was it, you fought they together? together. <laughs> no matter what color they were, they had to be together in order to live. Try to get back. Yeah. yeah so they were together. Did you go overseas? Yes, I spent two and a half years over. What part? In Europe. And was there any problems with the military when you went to? Yes, uh, I was drafted in nineteen forty. When we left disappeared. Of course, we were all integrated. Went to Massachusetts and we were integrated for about a month. We were segregated. We left and went over to Europe and I guess for the first three months we were integrated. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden we were segregated. So, by choice or they no, were not forced? By choice. Yeah. We had, a, I would say, a unique situation where I was stationed most of the time that we were there. We had German kitchen help. We did not have to do certain things. And we supervised the Germans in the quartermaster depot where I was stationed. But I embrace what Mr. Mercer said. Uh, over there, you were separated, but when you went to clubs, things like that, restaurants, you were all integrated. You really could feel the prejudice when you got back close enough to see the Statue of Liberty. Mm -hmm. Never will forget that as long as they are here. Mm -hmm. Those guys we gamble with, we broke bread together, mm -hmm. the bottom of the ship we got sick, threw up together, all of this was fine. But the moment they saw the Statue of Liberty, mm -hmm. you could tell they separated themselves from us, just like you put mm. all the water together. Mm. I mean, it's, it's, mm. you, it, it's, it's like a fantasy. You will not believe that people would have as much unity mm -hmm. in a certain situation, and then in another situation, you don't care. But it sure happened, right? Mm -hmm. I can identify with what you said. Because I went through. Want to do something really nice for your friends? Next time you go out with them, if they're going to be drinking alcohol, offer to be the designated driver for the evening. That means you stick to non-alcoholic drinks and drive everyone home safely. Next time, one of them can do the same thing for you. You could be saving them from being arrested or having a serious accident. You could even be saving their lives. Now that's what I call a friend. For more information on drinking and driving, Write the Will Rogers Institute, White Plains, New York. My name is Dr. Arleta Hallam. I'm the director of the Clearwater Public Library System. And we want to welcome you to this program on the history of the Greenwood area and talking in terms of oral history, local history, with some of the people who have lived here, are still living here, 
and are really prominent in this community. So I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce them. First, we have Christine Morris. I even met her as Miss Chris. I think everybody knows her in this community as Miss Chris. But Chris moved to Clearwater in February of 1926. You don't even look old enough to have done that. With her parents from Register, Georgia. And she attended Curtis Elementary School and the Pinellas Junior and Senior High Schools. And we're going to find that that's a common denominator among several of you as we talk today. She also attended the Bethune Cookman College in Daytona Beach and the University of South Florida. Chris retired from the city of Clearwater after 33 years in the library department and was the manager of the North Greenwood Branch Library, which was Northeast and probably had several names during that time period. So we're glad you're here with us today, Chris. Next to her is uh, Dr. William, and you have McKinley on there, Harris, who is the principal of the Largo Middle School and has also been principal of schools in Tarpon Springs and Dunedin. He has his PhD in educational leadership from the University of Florida, his master's in science education from Fisk University and BS in biology, and you're an adjunct professor at Nova University and the Minister of Music at Mount Carmel Baptist and Mayor's appointee at the City of Clearwater Environment Committee currently. Right? Busy man. Glad you could join us today. K.D. Mercer came to Clearwater in April of 1946 and he had been in the World War II and came to visit his sister, liked it here, went back to Illinois and came back. Is that correct? And decided this was a good place to make a home. And he is best known, I guess, for being deacon at Mount Carmel Baptist Church, but somebody told me that you were also a mighty good bowler, so. I've <laughs> 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 broadened your interest a little bit, right? <laughs> um, Robert Young is the owner of the Young's Funeral Home, and he was born in Clearwater in April, April 18 of 1944 and attended Curtis Elementary and Pinellas High School, Miami-Dade Community College, and then graduated from the Dallas Institute of Mortuary Science, Dallas, Texas in 1972, and as we mentioned, is the owner of Young's Funeral Home, and you have a whole list of awards here, so you've been involved in a lot of things. Next to him in the tan jacket is Tal Rutledge. Tal also was born in Clearwater, and you're running a store just down the street from where your parents had a grocery store. Is that true? So you have stayed very much involved in this community. Attending Curtis Elementary and Pinellas High School, continuing his education at the Florida A&M University in industrial education. Tal served for many years as president of the NAACP. He helped found the North Greenwood Association and is currently on their board of directors and is presently serving on the Pinellas County School Superintendent Minority Advisory Committee. He's been a business owner since 1953 in the North Greenwood area. And on the end is Ron Hamm. Ron also attended Curtis Elementary and Pinellas High School. And the morning after he graduated, his mother said, get him out of town. We're going to keep him off the streets and send him off to Connecticut for 13 years so he would stay out of trouble. Did it work? Yes. Sir. You didn't find trouble in Connecticut? No. <laughs> um, he was in the Vietnam War. He returned to Clearwater and continued his education at St. Petersburg Junior College working on a degree in accounting. Ron has been very active as a coach with the Clearwater for Youth Association. He's employed by the City of Clearwater in the Gas Department and also with Young's Funeral Home. So we are glad to have such a prestigious group this morning to talk with you about the Greenwood Association. And since so many of you went to school here, let's start talking. You can just talk among yourselves about Curtis Elementary School. What was it like? Who were some of your favorite teachers? Who wants to start? Where's a favorite teacher? Belcher. Okay, tell us about Miss Belcher. Uh, she was the first grade teacher, and she uh, she ran the uh, summer program for for the kids. Uh, every summer we had a program over here at uh, 
Pinehurst High School and Ms. Belcher made sure we had always had something to do for the summer. And she just, she was almost like your mother away from home. But the whole neighborhood was like that when, when we grew up here in North Greenwood. If every uh, adult person was your parent, don't care who, what kid you was, who you was, you, you listen at the grown people during those days. Yeah. Other memories, system favorites? I'd like to think of not just one in elementary school, but a uh, whole slew of my elementary teachers, Hattie Eagle, <coughs> Cleo Hooks, Demery Hooks, Nancy Speed, uh, our principal, uh, Ms. Cobbs, uh, there were a whole slew of Mr. Hooks, and all of those people have gone on. But I look back in a number of times, fond memories of the, the of what they instilled in us during those days. We went on from there to high school, and I looked at some of those teachers over there who did basically the same thing to us. I certainly can identify with uh, what my Patel just said as to having a favorite, but there was Mrs. Ellis, uh, again Mrs. Belcher, Mrs. Hurd, uh, Mrs. Gaines, uh, Mrs. Harris. Uh, just a whole gamut of teachers that really set the groundwork for where I am today. And I, I know when, after I came of age to attend grade school, where we moved to after moving off of what we referred to at that time as the height side of town, uh, my grandparents, my grandparents who raised me, gave me the choice of either going to Curtis Elementary, I'm sorry, William Elementary or Curtis Elementary. And the choice I made was Curtis and I glad that I made that choice and those were the teachers that I came in contact with uh, during my first through sixth grade uh, grade school experience. And I certainly appreciate all of those teachers and to, to single out one, I know one in particular is McDowell who apprised me about my father being uh, very artistic, which I did not <laughs> So she had had your that, father in school as had well? Had my father in school. Uh -huh. But that gift did pass it off to one of my offspring, my uh, second oldest child. He has drawing ability, but not good. <laughs> but not good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I missed that. Who <laughs> else went to Curtis Elementary? I did. <laughs> I think I am the oldest one of the Curtis Elementary children. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when my parents first came here, that was the school that they enrolled us in. I was, at that particular time, you did not have to be six years old. You could go at four or five. And the teacher that impressed me, two of them, there were quite a few of them, but the teacher, one of them lived in the neighborhood where we lived, and that was Mrs. Nelson. She retired from the public school system in St. Petersburg. And uh, Beulah Johnson, Horn, and Bessie, Gibson, Bessie Brown Gibson, and what I can remember of Bessie Brown Gibson, we used to come in and she had a beautiful voice and she would get up before we do anything and start singing. And we had to join her. So those are some of the people that impressed me going to the elementary school also with Dr. Rooks and Mr. Curtis, who the Curtis Elementary School was named after his brother. So those are some of the people and also my cousin, who was also the principal who died last year, and uh, she had a toehold on us. <laughs> because if we did not obey, we got it from her, and then she said, well, I'm, my father was her uncle. She said, I'm gonna tell Uncle Eddie on you. <laughs> so we knew, we knew as the weeks old children, we had to obey, and uh, it was instilled into us. And uh, I feel like that, um, that we had a good foundation, although we might not have had all of the essentials, but there was so much of values passed from the teacher to the student, and uh, I, it made me feel good that there was someone other than my parents who was interested in us. Now at that point schools were segregated, so we're talking about yes. totally blind right. schools. Right. Right. Were the teachers all black? Sure. Oh, sure. That was sure. That was another black elementary school we <laughs> called the Williams Elementary. Yeah. yeah. So that and came after. That came after. I did attend it. Oh, you know. Yes, yes, yes. 
So you did have a choice? There were two, eventually there were two schools, one on south and one on north. And uh, I lived south, so I attended Williams. And Williams, all I knew was Williams and Curtis, because by the time I came along. But uh, Williams was typically a good school. Two good things I remember about it. My first grade teacher was B. Lewis, who's uh, been on to become principal. She's retired Curtis now. Elementary. But she was the warmest person I think I've ever met. Just always encouraging as a first grader. Gosh, you just wanted to really be tall. And I'll never forget, in third grade segregation, there was a new Williams that opened. So what we did as students, we walked and we carried books from the old one to the new one. Almost three months. And once we did that, we planted the grass at that school, and we did all of that during the total school year. And of course, we had the big picnic at the end. And you know, it was so humbly, so just all in there, you never think about it now, how ridiculous. But this is what happened. Of course, the district gave you a building, and that's really all it gave you. Uh -huh. And it was left to the ingenuity of the people there to do everything else. And how we did it, and carried the, I think the whole, all the furniture, the boys did this, and the little girls were doing things there at school. But it must have taken a good third of that school year. Mm -hmm. No, we'll forget that. Another point of history yes. sorry, uh, with Williams, I think they were in the new school at that time, and that's when Curtis kids used to be bused over to Williams for lunch. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, I didn't know, know that either. I, I carried a bag lunch. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I know what I was missing. I was missing. Now that I think about it, Williams had a cafeteria. Williams had a cafeteria. So big. Curtis did not have a cafeteria. We had a hot We were bused from Curtis to Williams for lunch. I, 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 See, I remember that. Was that. Time. Okay. Which must We're have taken two. an extra hour out of the school day or something. Uh, I, you know, they, I, I can't remember the time, you know, mm -hmm. the time amount, what amount of time was allotted for that. But we were about to be right. Curtis. So they put that cafeteria when I was in fifth grade. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, one, one other thing that used to happen at Curtis, <coughs> when I was there, uh, uh, Stanley Kemp, I don't know if any of you remember. Oh, yes, I remember. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, had, a, had a restaurant, the restaurant right up the street, and what was the other lady's name? Uh, uh, that used to come out to pay our food off campus and bring it on oh, for lunch. Yeah, I can't lunch remember period. her name. Uh, I can't think of her name now. She had a restaurant up the street, and uh, they had an arrangement with the school that they would bring hot food uh -huh. out to the school, and, and they served it. I don't remember how we paid for it, 35 mm -hmm. cents or whatever. Or maybe 10 cents. Maybe. That's a 35 cents right now. It seems like it was a lot of money during that time. Yeah. Uh -huh. But uh, this is how we, uh, we uh, you know, we had lunch there. And uh, uh, Smith, Mrs. Smith. Oh, yeah. Those right. are the names that are hard to remember. Yeah. And uh, they would come out sometime if we, they had a little stand out there that uh, I happened to be in on one of them on several occasions to work in the stand and help serve sell those uh -huh. those goodies to the kids for for month five and ten cents mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just like to mention this, we're talking about Curtis, and I guess we can stay on Curtis all day. <laughs> but you know, yeah, there was one thing I incident that happened uh, at, uh, at at Curtis uh, one day. Uh, and I guess we were in a chapel uh, mm -hmm. set. And there were members from the Ku Klux Klan supposedly that came, yeah, well they were hooded. Oh, they came yeah. out mm -hmm. and and uh, they had their hoods up. And I, I, I say they, it had to be at least two, maybe three, but I can remember one in particular that, pre that presented an American flag to the school. Oh my God. Yeah. And, that was uh, my time. Oh yes, it was after your time. It was after. <laughs> we presented a flag to the school and one of our teachers, the one that I, I mentioned a while ago, Cleo, yeah, uh, you know, she was, you know, if you remember her, she was, she was peeping around trying to see behind that mask or that hood to see who was behind. He presented it? He presented a flag to the school. Uh, I don't remember all of the, you know, the one yeah, right, but right. the clan came to the school and presented the flag there on the white robe from the hood. Well, let me, since we own the KKK, I have a, I have an incident that uh, from a young child, uh, my father was in business, and he came home early one that particular evening and told my mother, because I had to, had to get the children in the house, don't let them go outside. The plan came down Garden Avenue and came up. This uh, Eldridge and marched to 
the green field, and there was a black team playing out there. They were all black, uh, not blacks, and it was Negroes then. <laughs> they were not chasing every time. And the people that were playing, the young people that were playing in there, that, that set up and about 15, they did a circle, and my oldest sister, who's still living today, was in the stadium, and the people jumped off of those whatever it says, the bleachers, and I think a couple of them got hurt. That happened right here where the area, where the parking lot for the the Philadelphia Phillies. So. Do others of you have memories of client incidences? I can remember since I came here you know, that um, at that time Jack was the stadium. Uh, Nico could go in the stadium, but he went in the stadium. Then the Ku Klux would come and put you out. And that was right in your backyard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have one other incident related to uh, clan activity uh, in Florida. Uh, I, I can't remember the incident that precipitated, supposedly, plan involvement. Uh, I was in the pool room, shooting pool up at uh, Buddy Brown, Buddy Brown building. Brown. And uh, I heard somebody run by and said, Clan run across down by Curtis. Mm -hmm. Well, I had this cue stick in my hand. <laughs> and so when he said that, I didn't know where he said he planned and was. So I turned the big end of that stick around looking for him to stick his head in that door. <laughs> <laughs> but he never did. So I looked out and there was a cross burning down on the corner of Marshall and, and Greenwood. Greenwood I remember. Three of us mm -hmm. got in the car, went down there where that cross was burning. And those of you that can remember Bill Williams, yes, mm -hmm. myself and, and mm -hmm. Fagan, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Fagan's car. Bill got out of the car, I was in the back seat. And he grabbed that cross and threw it over in the ditch. There used to be a little ditch there mm -hmm. at the time. He threw it and said, Yeah, well, we go look for him. We went looking for things. We didn't find him high over there. Because they had this rope and everything. Well, they had gone, yeah. But uh, we came back and we stayed around. That time, I guess we were beginning to lose that fear of mm -hmm. the clan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Since you, you know, we got on the clan all the yeah. time. Well, that's, that's what I was <laughs> going to ask. Was, was there a fear or was there a feeling of wanting to fight the clan? Well, I think you're saying here there was a transition. I was beginning to change. You see, knowing me over the years, I've always had a temper. And I, I've learned, I've got enough whooping behind it to learn how to control it somewhat. And uh, even now, I, 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 well, I've, I've learned pretty good how to control my temper. But it was a fear. It was a fear. Yeah. Yeah. And now, the, this happened after that incident that Chris talked about that happened over here at the field. You remember? Oh, yeah, I remember. I wasn't there that night, but I remember it very well. There was a lot of stories behind mm -hmm. that. And uh, people were running. But see, there was more fear during that time than mm -hmm. the time. That time. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you what, right now, <laughs> I don't think Clam got nerve enough to walk down that street mm -hmm. now. I don't think they have enough nerve now to try because we have too many uh, young That's people out there that was really, there will be a few dead people. <laughs> yeah, I'm like you, I think there was transition going on during that period because I remember growing up in the 50s and I don't know of any direct plan activities per se, but it, fear had begun to cease, I think, and the attitude of, let's do this head on. You know, the 60s were precipitated by that attitude that really came along, you know, but no, 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 let's do some things. It was just a matter, I think, of some rules making some changes. But I think about even the late 50s, how we did become quote arrogant, yeah. and we did become sort of not so quiet to some things, so you're right. But I think the most, the most part of this about being here, uh, most Negroes know they could not win, you know, because the Negroes wouldn't stick together. And then say come in about 50 or 75, claim went to about 20 or 25 Negroes, and there is no win. Mm -hmm. Where did Black Pride start? Was it built into you in school? At home, at home, at home, at home, at home. The school, oh, see, we, 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 there were some trade-offs in oh. this. And I, people like to refer to it, some people like to refer to it as immigration, I refer to it as desegregation. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> there was, there, we first of all, for the most part, we got it at home, we got it at school, we got it at church. And I think at all three of those 
institutions now, it has waned somewhat. And I think this is what we were in a meeting just recently, hopefully, we didn't get quite to this, but hopefully we could go and re-instill some of this, particularly coming from the home and again from the church. Mm -hmm. and, and we need to, I think that's a part of our problem today, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. throughout the, the entire community. The homes don't do it as much as they used to, and I don't think, I don't know about other churches, but I know we used to get this kind of thing in the mm -hmm. black churches. Mm -hmm. And we need to go back to that. This is one of the trade-offs that we made during desegregation of the school. We don't get it in the school <coughs> now like we used to. You know, because our teachers then, our own and our segregated schools, were your parents away from home. We got a lot of good counseling. You teach families because yeah. you know there was that. You know, one of the things, too, we talk about home, school, uh, church, but you look at the religiousness of us now compared to when we came along. You know, one of the things that moving to that mainstream, we lost that we lost. relationship yeah. of religion. I mean, it's so obvious. We talk about the church, but if the church were to do all the things that it should do, who would it reach? Yeah. What per percentage of the people would it reach yeah. now? You know, unfortunately, you still teach or preach to the same choir yeah, exactly. in most cases, I think. Yeah. yeah. You're saying then that the black pride has waned, that it is. It's less today than it was when you were growing up? I would say the value. Uh, it is waned, but with value, the, because we've gotten caught up in mainstream. Yeah. Yeah. mainstream. Mainstream America we have is like more. Else. And let's face it, another thing that has happened, everybody has their own little uh, mm -hmm. uh, channel, uh, their own little role, mm -hmm. and they forget about the yeah. less fortunate. Yeah. Uh, all of the people that really need the help Absolutely. and uh, we just don't take the time as adults to do something for the people that are less fortunate than we are. We have gotten away from a lot of the things that maybe I was raised with but I try to stay into the mainstream of the black community. That's why I'm still in the black community. I like to touch the lives of some of the children but nowadays for the past 10-15 years the people have come here from different cities and states. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that that has made a difference. The children are not, the parents are not clear water people. Mm -hmm. They don't know the Harris, they don't know the Youngs, or the Talmadge, or the Hams. The founders, the pioneers of this mm -hmm. area have, you know, mostly gone. You've lost that inter-community right. communication. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I give you a good example. What it what, what kind of had is like we used to have the uh, black high school band and our band to me, now you go to the uh, band and say Clearwater High, you want, you might see one black sitting in a band. Well, we had a band here, every black kid that could play an instrument, had an instrument could play, was musicians. Well, you take now you don't have it. You don't have that black family. We have our homecoming. We had our yeah. black homecoming queen. It's not, it have not it been a black homecoming queen that I can remember. It could have happened. She might be a runner up or a, a second attendant, mm -hmm. but the kids do not select the black students as a homecoming queen. But the black kids are the football star at Clearwater High, they're a basketball star, whatever they take for athletes. You know, we can, they let us do it, but for be as homecoming queens, we have some pride into our young ladies in school. We don't get that like we had at the old uh, segregated kind of high. And to me, I miss that. We used to have the big parade for homecoming with our black floats and stuff. It was, it was a community effort. You know, if you had a nice car, you, you let, your, let the school use your convertible and you, you decorated it. And we had a big parade during, the, during my time. But am I also maybe hearing you say that now maybe the concern has transcended a racial thing where you're concerned about people, you're concerned about economic situations, or how many of you go to churches that are totally blind? Oh, that's the one thing I, I need to point out here, uh, uh -huh. uh, two of us here at United Methodist, we are part of a total connectional system with this both. There are some predominantly right. white churches, uh, but we can 
so choose to go to mm -hmm. First Church downtown if we so mm -hmm. desire. Right, right. Uh, so you're choosing. But but it's, but it's, a, it's a choice, mm -hmm. uh, and then then this is cultural too, uh, and I, and I and I'm not taking anything away from First Church, but our type or our, our method of worshiping is slightly different than First Church downtown. I know when we go down to sing, for the last two years now, we've had a choir exchange between Mount Zion United Methodist and First Church. <coughs> and, you know, uh, when when I explain to First Church choir director, you know, what we do, well, God, you will do a whole lot of singing, <laughs> whereas at First Church, the singing is less. But then there's an appreciation. But then our system still has some problems. I'm not going to sit here and say that that even though we're part of a total system, whereas mm -hmm. First Church, there's no difference between First Church and Mount Zion other than cultural uh, method of worshiping because we have a prescribed order of worship, but we can deviate from that. Uh, but there are problems with that system because if I sit here and say that if our pastor was to be called the First Church, I'm sure there would be a change in membership. Uh -huh. Whereas it, there would be a slight change in membership if a white pastor was to come to Mount Zion. I have always chosen an integrated church <laughs> and I really enjoy that kind of fellowship and yet I know that frequently people will talk in terms of cultural differences. What are the cultural differences that still exist? Mm, well, diet, our, our, you know, our, our, our okay. eating habits, even our, our, our method of worship. Tell, talk about the diet. What is what is the black and Afro-American? Talk about soul food. What did you eat? What do you still eat that might be different from what I would eat? In my church, uh, I go to a Presbyterian church, and when I first, I am, a, I was a staunch Baptist, and I moved from a staunch Baptist, and I still am a staunch Baptist, but I. But you're in a Presbyterian church. But I'm in a Presbyterian church. <laughs> And uh, with the inter, it is an integrated uh, uh, church. They wanted to know what they had missed, what we cooked compared to what they prepared. Now, once or twice a year, we prepare a soul food dinner, like last Sunday. We had all like pig's feet and spare ribs and collard greens and black eyed peas, you name it. And uh, my friend and I, Liz Simmons, some of the white people had never eating a potato pie. Mm -hmm. Never eating a potato pie. So we started the potato pies going. And now they like the potato pies better than to do the pumpkin pies. Yeah. Integrated churches have much better potlucks. You know, I had an experience. Excuse me. Uh -huh. I had an experience over the Jewish, before it moved down over near uh, Cleveland Pass. Yeah. That was my thing. Yeah. Uh, that was, uh, I went there, oh, back in, I guess, the 60s, somewhere, late 60s, early 70s, to do a presentation there, and they had a, a dinner, and I was surprised uh, at the B'nai, Temple of B'nai, Israel, mm -hmm. whatever it was, mm -hmm. <laughs> and man, that food was so good, yeah. <laughs> So I was embarrassed to go back for seconds, but I certainly wanted it. <laughs> but I said, you didn't tell me these people cook like this? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was it was, it was pushing a close second to soul food. Because <laughs> <laughs> you know what, that's true, because many of the soul foods are southern dishes, uh -huh. are just highly seasoned yeah, foods. You, right. know, right. you know, when you really think about it, you say, who cooked this? Yeah. And like you're saying right. there, you gotta say, ooh, and ask that game, because it depends on the cook and the amount of seasonings and stuff like that. Uh, I think cultural differences vary because of various reasons. Mm -hmm. Let me say that. You know, we call it more and more. But say, yeah, because segregation, and then you look, because I think so much as we really, blacks especially, move into the mainstream, which I like. That, I think, I find it so very difficult to part. Tal represent blacks, or Harris to represent black. Mm -hmm. You know, you yeah. represent Tal, and I represent yeah. Harris. You've got a total diversification now, and there are blacks who know nothing about quote soul food, and that's true. okay. That is true. Mm -hmm. And we want everybody to relate to the same. It's very difficult, I think, for us in the, this century. We're right, we're in transition, mm -hmm. and we're going from knowing every family here for all of these years to blacks that I don't know, mm -hmm. blacks who are from the very top 
of the strata all the way down. down to the and some who don't relate to this, and we think that's awful, may very well be what we've got to realize as a people and as a country, finally, thank God for America for that. We can rise above. Mm -hmm. We came up in a system where you couldn't. We're seeing the benefits of now of a country with all of its problems where you can do that. And we've got good, good blacks who are in positions, are in places where they have no concept of any of this we talk about. You're right. Mm -hmm. You're definitely right. And they're not so raw. They ought to learn some history. Mm -hmm. But what happens, we want to associate every black with this up with mobility. Many of them started at mobility. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. yeah, you know, this is why I say we need to redevelop. Redevelop. Yeah, that's redevelop exactly right. that that's exactly right. There you go. That's what we got. Plus to we're really. finding blacks who grew up in other other places and coming here. Right. Yeah, right. And say, exactly. where have you been? Now uh, Heidi, you you went to school where? Chicago? Uh, I went to school in Illinois. Uh, I went to uh, high school in uh, Daytona. Did you go to a totally blind school growing up? No, they uh, were mixed. Okay. Well, yeah. how, how was your culture in Illinois different, growing up black in Illinois in a, an integrated school, different from what you're hearing from these people? Well, um, where I came up at, uh, I guess it was still segregation, you know, to a certain extent, but uh, you could uh, play with white children, you know, you come up black and white together. Okay. And, uh, well, I never, never knew anything about uh, the way the way people had to be separate until I came to Georgia. My mother brought me to Georgia. Mm -hmm. And after we came to Georgia, then this was the way it was. We got the country, then the white couldn't play with black, black couldn't play with white. Did you eat salt food? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who were your heroes growing up? Who was my heroes? Because we sort of look to, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. We, you know, we look to our pastors, our teachers. And then those yes, that were in those that went business, yes, and of course Jack Robinson. Mm -hmm. Right, Jack Robinson, you know, to baseball star. Mr. Lewis. Joe Lewis. Yeah. I think that was my first hero. Joe Lewis. I was a That's why I say you were my first hero is uh, Dr. Bethune, Dr. Mayor McLeod Bethune. She was one well, of my first she was one of the heroes. Other than my parents, I just feel like they are the heroes uh, because they were such a had such a dynamic force, uh, and still in, in the six of us uh, that live to get grown, the values and uh, what the changes. Eventually, I can hear my parents now sometimes saying, "There will be a change before you die." I, I, and it's unbelievable. You didn't think it would be. <laughs> right. I really didn't, you know. And some of the things that happened before my father died at 81, some of the changes were beginning to come about then. And he would sit out and talk, and he said he thought it wouldn't happen, did he? I said, I sure did. He said, but it's going to happen. And it's going to get better. He said, but the day will never come that you'll be equal to the man on top. You know, the other people, you know, he said it's always going to be a downfall. Is that true? Yes, I see. Sure. sure. He said it's always going to be. Uh huh. You're not going to be. You're going to have to do it twice or three times. Be oh, I'm a little more optimistic than that. Oh, you are? And being yes, a black woman. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I just, I, I, in, personally, I just, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I see what you're saying. I understand yeah. what you're saying. But I feel if I can get enough other people to feel and think the way that I think. Oh, you can get them, baby. We're going to make a change. We're going to make that change. Good for you. Make the change. Make the change. I don't want to get, I don't want to, I don't want to reverse the situation. Oh, no, let's not. But uh, we're going to make that change. And I'm going to stick around. I ain't going, I'm not going to 81, 85. <laughs> <laughs> But <laughs> tell I might not make the hundred, but I'll, I'm going to be hanging in there. I'm going to get you to go along with me. <laughs> okay, you were all alive when segregation changed to desegregation. What's the first desegregated thing you remember doing? Restaurant. Mine was. How did you feel about it? 
tell us there was a was. feeling of pride. I was in school, and I remember Daytona so very well. Uh, the sit-in era had come about, and we were in Daytona, we go downtown, and we were sitting, and we were ready, ready for the big mama to come off the rest of us and all. And uh, believe it or not, the manager, after X number of minutes, did decide to serve the people. They did open the counters, and they really served them. So yours was part of a protest. You were oh yeah, I was part of that. Yeah, okay, sit-ins were part of the sixties, and about the time we were, you know, if they had come to Daytona, everybody was protesting, going to jail, and eventually, very slow, but they were being done. But by the time they came to Daytona, they did open the restaurants without the jailing incident, because we were all we were students from the film cookman, basically, and uh, we sat there and we talked and we ate. And I remember some comments made, ooh, this food is not as good as <laughs> <laughs> I'll never get there. Uh, there. There are some places on Second Avenue that just excel over that, you know. I can say they were a soul fool at all. But uh, well, but at any cost. And uh segregation changed to desegregation. What's the first desegregated thing you remember doing? Restaurant. Say it. How did you feel about it? Tell us there was where a it was. feeling of pride. I was in school and I remember Daytona so very well. Uh, the sit-in era had come about and we were in Daytona, they go downtown and we were sitting and we were ready, ready for the big mama to come off the rest of us and all and uh, believe it or not, the manager after X number of minutes did decide to serve the people. They did open the counters and they really served them. So yours was part of a protest. You were oh yeah, I was part of, of that, yeah. Okay, Sit-ins were part of the 60s and about the time we were, you know, if they had come to Daytona, everybody was protesting, going to jail and eventually very slow, but they were being done. But by the time they came to Daytona, they did open the restaurants without the jailing incident. Of course, we were all, we were students from the film cookman, basically, and uh, we sat there and we talked and we ate. And I remember some comments made, ooh, this food is not as good as <laughs> <laughs> I'll never get there. There, there are some places on Second Avenue that just excel over that, you know. I can say they were a soul fool at all. But uh, well, but at any cost. And uh, one of the waitresses came up and she says, "Oh, I'm so glad you did this." So she went on, and believe it or not, it, it went from a feeling we wanted to be heroes. I think that's what it was. We were ready to go to jail. <coughs> and it was unfortunate because college kids were going to jail. We were never jailed. <laughs> we had that kind of pride where we wanted to say, this is what we did. And really the attitude was, I'm like, you we were arrogant. How dare you open this counter? Let us go to jail. I mean, I cannot say I was, in, I think I was Jillian, it, well, I was, that I didn't go to jail. Everybody at that time went to jail because you sat in and everybody opposed and, we did. <laughs> and of course, when you look back at it, though, but uh, the attitude of just, it, it, it is still a sense of pride for some people, but I said it last night, and he said it just now, I guess Harris has instilled that pride in us long before this came about. Mm -hmm. We knew who we were, mm -hmm. we knew what we were about, and uh, <laughs> you had a problem, we didn't. <laughs> that was, that was <laughs> you know, that, we, 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 knew, we knew that from day one. No, I was in Illinois with KD. <laughs> 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 I am <laughs> but, uh, so, But for many people, it really did give that sense of, but you know, the attitude of just being able to be a Obviously, did add something to your self-image or language. Ron, what was the first desegregated thing you did? Well, well I left here in '65. So like I said, about two days after I graduated from high school, and was segregated here. And when I got to Hartford, Connecticut, it was like a whole different, uh, it was a shock treatment. Mm -hmm. Because see, when I left Clearwater at 17, it was black and it was white. And the first job I got up there was well, my aunt had me a job when I got there. You, that was a must. And I went to work for a Jewish guy at a furniture store. And 
a couple of white guys in there. I was black, one guy was Italian. It wasn't a black or white issue, it was a uh, Italian, Jewish, whatever. It was a nationality issue, and that, and that shocked me because I wasn't used to that. You know, all I, like I told you, I said, well, I'm from the South, I said, it's black or white. Then you had the Puerto Ricans to deal with. You know, I was, I was in the world, I was in a whole different, it took me, I think, about a year to adjust. You know, because I wasn't used to the different uh, nationality people. I was used to, you were black, you stayed here. In, in Harvard, you went anywhere you wanted to go. You know, and I was you know, 17, I've been, I was going, I'd never been in a bowling lab until since I was 17. You know, I didn't know nothing about bowling. Mm -hmm. But I think third month I looked up, I went to the bowling lab because of the school and it bowling. Took, right? Yeah, I said, well, you know, what? what is a bowling lab? You know, <laughs> it was just a whole different treatment from the South. And, and when I came back to Clearwater, uh, about two years later, before I went, went overseas, it was had uh, changed a little down here. It, it was the blacks were going to uh, different places downtown and stuff like that. But you could still see it was still segregated to a point. And then I went after service, I stayed up, went back to Connecticut, and I refused. I said I would never come back to Clearwater. Because I just couldn't, I didn't want to ever live in a segregated place anymore. I had got used to the freedom of the North. Mm -hmm. But see, North is a different kind of uh, presence in the, in the North and a different in the South. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, learned, I probably learned that. Mr. Young, what's your first memory? Unfortunately, I can't remember it, <laughs> and and then I can identify with this, you know, with segregation. But it's when I first went into a restaurant, there was no problem. So mm -hmm. I, I can't recall mm -hmm. that, you know, because. But there was a time that you knew it was okay. I mean, was there was there like a date that the the walls came down or the doors opened or? that you knew it was going to be okay? You know, here, it was so hard because it depends on the place. Okay. It was not a one thing that happened, did it? It depends mm -hmm. on where you sort of knew where to go, oh, right. where not to, and slowly mm -hmm. the walls tumbled. Yeah. But those walls were rough tumbling. Mm -hmm. I remember the word got out that the cap theater, uh-oh, you can go to that theater, but you, the cap will go into another, or that kind of thing. In this place, go and eat. And of course, you would see many of the blacks who would go out there to eat. <laughs> you know, the kind of mindset uh, yeah. uh, the segregation had on you. All of a sudden, you didn't want to eat out. You know, because you couldn't. There were no places that you said available. I remember the first time going up the state, too. And all of a sudden, you were eating out. I never thought of eating out because at home, yeah, there was, there was, you didn't, you know, there was a mindset that happened with you. You didn't worry about doing things because you'd never been allowed to do. And you would have thought, well, this is, you don't do it in a way. So as that transition came about, I guess, eating out and many of the other things, I guess, we were slow doing along with. And, and that's another reason for not doing it. You had an economic reading, you know, thing too. People sometimes just couldn't do it. And then, of course, one of the things I remember going through the humiliation. You know, you go, you saw it with careful because you know, you, you, you're sick of being humiliated. Sometimes it's rather not go do it as opposed to go through the kind of treatment and that kind of thing that you hear about it, you know, that could happen or you're reading about in other places. You, you, you get a trade off. But even the restrooms were separate, right? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So at, at what point did the everything? The drink and The drink and Oh, doctor's office. I was oh. Gene Bennett because Gene Bennett was my <laughs> oldest child. He was the first pediatrician here with a, uh, an in a desegregated officer. <laughs> and I remember a good friend of mine, Joe Carwise, and, uh, called and told me he had gone to this lady. She had just come here basically. She had one waiting room. And yeah, he had lights in number blocked to her office because of that. Most of these doctors' waiting rooms. They had a black and a white. Black, white, and when they eventually they finished, you got waited on. I got and it was a report. report, report. Mm -hmm. See that? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Say what, uh, uh, Dr. Heaps, remember Dr. Heaps? Oh, yeah, uh-huh. And I went in, you know, being young, too, and I sat down, and he came to me, and he came, he was very polite, he was good, because he didn't make, make a house call for you. And he'd come out there, and he said, it doesn't make you put out concerned about my other patients. He took a chair and sat out on the front porch. That's just how I had to sit. See that? And, 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 and that was nice. Yeah, that was nice. That was nice. Some of the places the doctor's office would have, you know, the big buildings, where Daniel's fashion shop, you remember, and they had this big up. 
upstairs and I Dr. was going to Dr. Hayden. Right. Dr. They had a hall, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's you where the hall sat in the hall. Sure, I Until your, and if your name was called, okay, and if it wasn't called, it still was okay. Exactly. But you sat in the hall. Even the lawyers, Absolutely. even the lawyers, although you would pay them maybe the same price you would pay a, a white person would pay. But uh, you still had to be segregated. You could not sit in, you know, uh -huh. you couldn't sit. The dentist, every, everything was segregated. What about shopping? Oh, don't mention oh, the story. Oh, know. let me tell you. Uh, let me tell yeah. you about the department store. <laughs> I never shared with you. <laughs> Once I love hats, <laughs> and the women couldn't. Black women or Negro women at that time could not try on a hat unless they gave you a stocking cap or something to put a tissue paper to put on your head, which a white person would not have to do. Right. <laughs> and I never forget this incident at Daniel's Fashion Talk. I went to get this hat every year during my husband's lifetime. He would always buy me a hat for Easter. He'd give me the money to go get it. And I went to Daniel's Fashion Shop and this sales clerk, the hat I wanted was in the display. And she said, I'm sorry, I cannot take that hat out the display. I said, well, why? I said, couldn't you take that one out and put another one in? She said, oh, no, I can't do it. And I, you wouldn't believe it. I started cross the sales counter at her. <laughs> <laughs> and the sales manager, the lady that was the manager of the store, Mrs. Milton, who was Mr. Milton, once was the city manager, and she heard my voice. And she came downstairs and she said, Wigfall, well, that was the trade name. She said, what's going on? And I began to explain it to her. She said to the sales clerk, you get the hat out the window and replace it with another one if she wants it. We are out here to sell the products. So you're the right person. <laughs> <laughs> you're the right, like you said, you're the right Negro. You're the right. Yes, you got Wigfall, so that's it's right. Because right. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. you know, she thing. didn't call you Miss or Miss. Oh, no, no, of course not. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, we shopped at Facebook one store, Frank's. Right. Oh, uh, yes, no, right across the railroad I mean, track. So, yeah, Frank, because Frank treated you. Treated you but they were Jewish, right? They were Jewish. Yeah, they were Jewish. Jewish. Yeah, yeah, they were Jewish. And I mean, all of our house were with that, and we could go, and he knew we were Gus Harris's children. <laughs> we would lie. That's how you did it. But the other store, she didn't do it. Yeah. You talk about called Mr. or Miss. I remember an incident. My dad was a yard person. Uh, landscape. I mean, way back when it was so popular out in Bel Air. And, uh, you know, you know, oh, you know, he did the parks out there. He did it. We would work. And what would always get my younger brother and I for that, as the people and many of them were, uh, uh, guests who would come six months or so, I mean, and most of his houses were vacant half the time. But when they would come, and these were no others, he of course addressed everybody as sir or mister, and kids, what have you. They could call him Gus, and he would say, yes, sir. And so Calvin and I decided we'll fix them. <laughs> <laughs> so when the fellow, one of the fellows, the name was James Bennett, Bennett Mr. Mr. Bennett came out, and he spoke and he said something, and we said, okay, James. <laughs> and he listened, he said, what did you say? James, what did you say? Well, he would have told Dad, Gus, you better go and talk to those boys. And he, apparently he told him what we had done. But my dad took us home and told my mom he'll never <laughs> carry out the work at another house where the people were. So from that point on, that's what we love it. We didn't like it you got but the work we, had <laughs> we stayed around the house, but he made sure whatever yards we cut, those people were up north. I mean, we didn't have that much more contact. Little no kids, four, five, six, he must always address them. They were sir. He was gossip. And another thing that uh, uh, I think it doesn't happen today, but when when we were when I was coming along, like if uh, the only policy that you could get the 
sales rep had to come to the house. Insurance. Insurance. Oh, no. And, oh, please. <laughs> and they would call you Annie, or what was the other name they would call you? <laughs> Sadie, John, or whatever. John, Tom, yeah, or Tom, Tom, or whatever. Not your name. Not I'm your not. name. I just walk in. And walk, just in. walk in. Walk in and take over. Oh, no. oh, yeah. oh, oh yes. yes. <laughs> and see, the policies they sold to black. Oh, please. These old street industrial kind of things. No money. You pay on them for all your life. And you like, well, like you get from okay. that. He, he sees it. it all the time. He, you know, just re that was all. I remember I started teaching in 64, I believe. And uh, during that time, the slow changes were starting. And of course, private teaching group was the largest professional yeah, group right. around uh -huh. here. And I remember New, New York Live. Like, I you remember that? that? Yes. Yeah. That yeah. law was <laughs> one of the first people to begin to appeal to, to the black. Life. And the attitude, of course, we flock to it because now you can get some comparable policies for reasonable prices. First time ever, but before that, insurance companies didn't cater to us, or they could care less. You had they sell you little one. policies. And they Absolutely. Sell, they sell you I one. Mean, they just don't get paid. Yeah. Oh, just yes. Yeah. It's typical of the corner store yeah. where everything is higher there than across, the, and yet you have a smaller amount of money. So, no. Oh, we could tell you a lot. Yeah. <laughs> you are. <laughs> no, I can recall that uh, uh, my mother, the only time they used to ration meat. No, 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 he, no, he wouldn't remember that. I remember. I remember right I'm over. just teasing. No. I, remember. <laughs> <laughs> you go ahead. I remember the ration of buttons, yeah. but you go ahead, big guy. Yeah, we had to get in line to get meat, you know. So my mother went down to the store to buy some meat. The line was lined up, and so when she got there, there was a little beautiful piece of smoke baked, you know, with the English streets in it. And so she wanted a piece of that baked. So a white lady came up and she just walked up in front of the front of the front of my mother. And uh, they, they let her have the meat for her. She, she should have went to the back of the line, but she didn't. So my mother asked her that she wanted that piece of meat. She told her she couldn't get it. So she gave her a piece of white back. Mm -hmm. uh, fat back. Fat back. Yeah, mm -hmm. fat back. Mm -hmm. And so I was just a small fella and so it made me mad because she started crying, you know. Mm -hmm. And I told the man, I said, to him, if I was a big man, then I would kill you. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's the kind of thing that happened with that, that added your pride and your sense of being. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what, you know, you were talking just now, same thing with him. Almost in any issue. If it was a line, a white person always had presence right, over you. Right. There's no question about that. If it's a small walkway, you know who's going to get, get off. You almost, yeah, those incidents no, happen. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you knew that. You wouldn't dare. And the law said, of course, the law supported yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Police, you, black, somebody says now, well, why be happy with officer friendly? But too many of us remember mm -hmm. when there was no officer <laughs> friendly. <laughs> and matter of fact, there are too many mentalities that yeah. still that carry on like that in our society. You know, you come and deal with life in a much different way. There are a lot of subtleties, as we're saying, that you still tell a difference. But there are so many of the things that we will remember this feeling. That will still be still, still there. there. That, in people, the back of our I head. wonder why police want to have such a problem when they come in the to black. black. Yeah, right. Yeah. Now. Yeah. See, yeah. The, the, the police one was always used to enforce the Jim Crow and, and segregated laws. Oh, He'd come yeah. out then uh, roughshod all over you. And that mentality is still in the black community. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. And they wonder why. And I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but they wonder why they can't get any information when they come into the black yeah. community. Is it because uh, the police were always used to oppress and suppress black people? Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's what that's always. Right. So that, that means he's never been a friend. friend. He's that's never right. been an officer to help. That's true. That's why the other people mm -hmm. he's been one to hurt, to hinder. Mm -hmm. How do your children feel different from the way you feel about being black? Do you see a difference in the attitudes of your children? Let me let me let me give you a scenario here. Back during the sixties, I believe it was, when we established the liaison committee. <coughs> Some of you can remember that liaison committee. The chairman of the liaison committee asked <coughs> asked me, us blacks in that committee, uh, at that time when we had these discussions going on. If black people taught their kids to hate white people. My honest answer at that time was no, because I, I honestly did not feel that blacks mm -hmm. were taught 
as opposed to what we saw, you know, white kids being called. But since that time, is that what I see out in the community now is that there seems to be, and I don't know that it is, it is taught verbally, but maybe by actions, that it seems as if a lot of the youngsters who are coming along now are taught to dislike, to hate mm -hmm. white. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying it's right, but this is what I think I see out there. But back during the time that, that question was asked, it, it, it did not happen. But I'm looking at something out there now, and you see, these are the kind of things that I think about every day. And I, I used to wonder how and why certain things happen. And what I, I have come to the conclusion that a lot of things that I see happening in the community with our younger people today, uh, uh, these things are not being verbally taught, but they are being taught by our actions yeah, and our kids an see us, okay. how we act, react towards the other people, and this is how they pick it up. And, Absolutely. And, and a lot of times adults are not the role models for the community and the children. They pick up. They, right. pick, they see right. it, you right. know. So like the six of us on this panel, we could go and stop a child from doing something. There could be other adults could say something and there would be a, maybe a big fight, a, 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 a argument, something like that. And uh, if you're not a role model, believe me when I tell you, because I can walk Greenwood anytime I get ready. Absolutely. I'm not afraid. Absolutely. And I know young men in their 20s and 30s, and if they see me coming, and if they're drinking up, it's against the law to drink the beer on the outside of the place. And if they're saying a, a profanity, they'll look up, they say, here come Miss Chris, shut up your mouth. Absolutely. <laughs> out of respect. <laughs> out of respect. Out of Absolutely. respect. And uh, there are people, you know, that they respect in the community, but the newer generation, as Tal said, there isn't that respect. I don't know what has happened. Do you think it's worse here than it is in other parts of the country? Those of you who have lived other places and go other places now? It's not, it's not, the difference is between the north and the south, where I worked up north, is that I was black, I was self as a black person. It wasn't that just because I'm black I wasn't uh, good enough to do I did, I got any emotions came up that I was qualified for up north. Here, because I'm black and I'm qualified, you don't get it. Because, number one, you don't eat, you don't socialize with them, you don't drink with them, or you don't party with them. Uh, uh, that I call it, you're not in the clique. You gotta be in the clique. And see, I'm a, they, they call me, I'm a maverick. I'm an outlaw in my job. Because see, I speak up for what's right. And I have black, other blacks that work down there with me. When I went for that position, they told me, don't do it because I'll make it too much wave. I told him I don't want me to sit all my life on the back end of a shovel. That is what that's, my thing is to progress and go forward. I want to be as high as I can. You know, I, I got ambitions too, like anybody else. I don't want to be a worker. I want to be a, a boss man too. I want to be a leader. I got potential. I was going to say that I think that as we we see trends in that, I think as you go in areas where you have large minority populations, you see larger opportunities, larger whatever, smaller, uh, the subtleness. Nobody, I, I, I like to say, gives up power. Nobody will, you know, if I'm the dominating factor, you're going to probably take whatever you get from it. In areas where you've got more strength in taking, you get probably less resistance and more openness. You see, we, a smaller city like Clover, we practice an awful lot of tokenism. You get the one here and the one there. Get in the larger cities, you probably the same thing, but greater proportions because you got so many more. You've got so many people who are qualified, certified, and, you know, sort of like St. Pete versus Clearwater. The difference is simply because sometimes, for some reason, we think sometimes that Vanilla County has black in St. Pete. You know, that's the population. <laughs> and everything there, when blacks become visible, it's the St. Pete population, which is tremendously larger and, of course, more poor, but at the same time. So I think it depends on where you are, where you go. Clearwater has been a mecca, though, over the years mm -hmm. of blacks. Mm -hmm. It has taken a very subtle stand, very conservative stand, mm -hmm. but a stand almost, uh, what you say, y'all older in that sense that I am, but basically 
of at least being decent about subtly, but so because I know over the years the experts have been so. You, it's, oh, they're very they're good at that. Yeah, they're good at right. that. You know, but at least there's been a place in which we've seen the migration, especially of blacks from Georgia areas and yeah, who really have been Mississippi, Alabama. who over the years have come here mm -hmm. and in comparison to where they've where come, they came from, this mm -hmm. is a mecca, mecca mm -hmm. you know, so we've yeah. seen that. We've, the city has been more tolerant, but at the same time, like you say, mm -hmm. much more so. Mm -hmm. And I, you know what, and that's the thing about, as long as you keep me ignorant, you can control me. <laughs> but if you ever can let me mm -hmm. be exposed, and you're going to have problems. Have problems. And that's what's happening, yeah, more and right. more and more. Uh, once we go to the mountain, once we go to Mecca, <laughs> yeah. I've never been there. You know, that reminds me of a part of Dr. King's speech. He said something to the effect of uh, uh, freedom is never voluntarily that's right. given that's to the Given to the press. It has to be demanded. That's right. That's right. Nobody gives it up. By, it is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It has to be demanded by the oppressed. Right. So we have to demand. We have to fight for this yeah. stuff. Yeah. And it's not an easy task. Yeah. We're in. I mean, I think America's really. We're in transition. Been we're too long. We need to. That's but right. we, but we are. We. I mean, we're moving. Yeah, we're moving yeah. out yeah. of the valley. Yeah. We're getting up yeah. the scales. And up. more and more and more, you know it, and I see it. Economics is going to be the big difference yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. for it all. It is. Economic, even now. I look at, I'm looking at, and I'm going to make this statement, I'm looking at the influence, listen carefully to what I'm saying, I'm looking at the influence that this country has globally as far as people of color is concerned. Mm -hmm. Think about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, I have a feeling we could go on four more hours, but I bet we all have other things to Some do. Some of us work for a living. Uh, <laughs> I started off with that. <laughs> I would like for each of you to think of one piece of advice that you would like to give a kid growing up in North Greenwood today. Who wants to start? Well, to tell you the truth, that children today need to be as my parents taught them to be obedient and to be careful with your company. Many times we get ourselves in the wrong company. Mm -hmm. We cause a lot of problems down the road. Well, I would say that uh, this is what I was taught even in school, before school. Get all of the education you can get. Yes, yes, yes. Be exposed to as much as you can. And again, mm -hmm. to reiterate what Mr. Mercer has said, be respectful of your health. Mm -hmm. They've been there. you got yet to get there. Mm -hmm. Well, I would say uh, the same as they have. My first uh, to keep, to help the North Greenwood, the first thing is to have faith in God. The second one would be a good education. And try to pick up on some values. Um, try to find a role model. And try to find someone that you would like to be, not like to be, but identify yourself and uh, obey your parents, obey your elders. As the Bible says, obey your mother and father that the days may be long over the land which the Lord thy God giveth you. And I strictly believe if you keep your eyes in the right direction and keep your path, you know, walk the path, and don't worry about what John is saying or what Mary is saying over here. Be concerned about yourself and your fellow man. You know what I would say? Well, I guess all of it, because I would say it for hours and hours. <laughs> but I said, rise above your present status. And more than anything else, don't get trapped in that. It's your cycle. Just rise above. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I dare you to be different. Mm -hmm. 
Dare to be different, yeah. but make sure the difference that you're daring to be is in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah. That it's respectful, that you're obedient, that the role model or this person life that you intend to emulate be that respectful person. But dare to be different. <laughs> well, I, I was thinking, uh, well, what, what my grandmother told me when I left to 165, try to treat every man, because regardless of color, the way you want to be treated, and it'll go a long ways for you, and be honest and truthful about what you do and say. You realize the advice you have given transcends all races, generations, <laughs> periods of time, and that's wonderful advice. It's advice we would all want for our children. I want to thank you for being our panelists today, and I'll go through them again and hope my memory works. <laughs> Chris Morris and McKenna yeah. Harris, Katie Morrison, Robert Young, Tal Rutledge, Ron and We really appreciate you taking the time to share your heritage with us today, and thank you for joining us. Thank you.